Sergeants, can you start your recordings, please? PC recording on the way. Sergeant Bradley, can you give the opening, please? Okay. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, will all panelists please turn on their videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin, Chair. Thank you, Sergeants. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I get into the, the topic that we have in this hearing today, I would like to say my prayer to everyone, especially the, long, uh, the, the police officer who was killed in the Capitol in the last couple of days. And I hope again that all law enforcement throughout the whole nation are taking all the necessary measures to be sure that everyone is safe especially after the FBI discovery plan to a, a attack, pot, potential attack in some capital building throughout the whole nation. So I know that this is a tough moment that we are living in. And I know that at the end of the day, people should be responsible for this terrorist attack, again, promoted by fake news of President Trump and former Major Giuliani. And I also like to thank the police commissioner for taking all the necessary measures to do all the investigation to find out if any police officer have any participation with a terrorist attack that happened in DC a few days ago. Good morning and thank you all for joining the Committee on Transportation's virtual hearing today on illegal parking and bike lanes. We will, we will be hearing also, we will also be hearing a related bill intro 2159 introduced by Council Member Levin and Speaker Johnson. First, I'm going to turn it over to the committee council to over some procedure items. Thank you, Chair. I'm Elliot Lynn, Counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist will be from the administration, from the Department of Transportation, Acting Commissioner Margaret Forgione, Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management Eric Beaton, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs Rebecca Zack, from NYPD, Chief of Transportation Kim Royster, and Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki, and from Oath, Deputy Commissioner for Legislative Affairs John Castelli. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and the chair or I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Uh, chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Elio. And good morning, everyone. Today, the committee of transportation convened remotely to hold this important hearing on illegal parking and bike lanes. We will also be hearing intro number 2159, a bill in relation to ha hazardous obstructions by vehicles and civilian complaints to the DOT for hazardous obstruction violations. In 2014, the de Blasio administration institute Vision Zero, a citywide initiative to improve the safety of all is strict. Everyone knows that this policy is following a World War, World War initiative and dedicated to save life. As part of an effort to combat prevent, preventable traffic violence, the initiative has included expanding enforcement against reckless and dangerous drivers, implementing new street designs and configurations enhancing public outreach and communication and implementing a number of pieces of legislation to increase penalties for dangerous drivers. 
to lay, today I look forward to hearing from the DOT administration in the regard to the illegal parking, including delivery trucks and how they all contribute to the city's congestion. We have certainly made progress addressing pedestrian, cyclists, and motorist death. Since 1920, since 1990, traffic fatalities in New York City have fallen from seven, 701 deaths in 1990 to an all-time low of 2202 deaths in 2018. In addition, traffic deaths have fallen by a third since the year before Vision Zero began. Although these results are encouraging, the past two years have seen a marked increase in the number of traffic fatalities. In 2020, at least 243 people died due to the traffic, cra traffic crashes, marking the, de the deadliest year since the implementation of Vision, Vision Zero. For a nearly two month period during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were zero pedestrian fatalities in New York City. However, as the vehicles returned, this trend quickly reversed with increases in overnight motorists and motorist, motorcycles death and a nationwide increase in speeding that began when a street emptied due to the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns. Although the mayor, the mayor maintained that Vision Zero has been effective, the recent statistics have begun to tell us that we have to continue working harder to make Vision Zero a reality. DOT parking regulation determine where vehicles can stop, stand and park throughout the city. However, and this is important. Parking enforcement is the sole responsibility of the NYPD, and they are responsible for actually administering parking tickets. Without enforcement, parking regulations alone will not address the problem. Illegal parking is in the city pose a serious safety hazard for all New Yorkers, especially cyclists and pedestrians. There have been numerous recent instances of pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers being killed or injured due to illegal parking. This is something that needs to be addressed, especially in light of the increase in fatality over the past two years. In addition to illegal park vehicles, we also know that in many communities, delivery vehicles have also been seen obstructing bike lanes and bus lanes. I would like to hear from DOT any plan they might have to ensure that we are minimizing the impact of these vehicles on pedestrians and cyclists as well. During today's hearing, the committee will look to learn more from DOT about their efforts to reduce illegal parking and bike lane obstructions, and ultimately to reduce traffic fatalities and injuries. In addition, Intro number 2159 by council member Levin and the speaker will be heard. The bill will create a penalty for hazardous obstructions by a vehicle and require DOT to create a civilian reporting program for such violations. Council member Levin has an early commitment but will give remarks on his bill when he joins us. Before we hear from the administration, I will now have our moderator and committee council recognize the members in attendance with us today, call on the administration to testify and administer the oath. And of course, I would like to welcome our new DOT commissioner, Margaret, for joining, someone that I had the honor to be working with her for so many years before she took onto the leadership of, of DOT. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Diaz, Rose, Ku, Minchaka, Cabrera, Deutsch, Miller, and Holden. Um, I'll now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Uh, Margaret Forgione, Eric Beaton, Rebecca Zack, Kim Royster, Michael Pilecki, and John Castelli. 
I will now read the affirmation and then I will call on each of you to confirm your response aloud for the record. If you could please raise your right hand. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Commissioner Forgione? Yes. Deputy Commissioner Beaton? Yes. Assistant Commissioner Zach? Yes. Chief Royster? Yes. Deputy Chief Pilecki? Yes. Deputy Commissioner Castelli? Yes. And, and uh, Michael Clark from Legislative Affairs. Thank you, yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Margaret Forgione, Acting Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. I am, I am joined by Eric Beaton, Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, and Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. On the topic of enforcement, we are also joined by NYPD Chief of Transportation, Kim Royster. And we are joined by John Costelli, Oaths Deputy Commissioner for Legislative Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Mayor de Blasio on illegal parking and bike lanes, as well as intro 2159. First, let me say that I'm incredibly honored to have the opportunity to serve as DOT Acting Commissioner. I believe so strongly in this agency and what we are capable of accomplishing. Throughout my years here, I've been impressed each and every day by our team's unfailing dedication to this city. I look forward to leading the agency during this time under the mayor's leadership and working with you, Chair Rodriguez, and the whole council as we continue our critical work and help New York City recover from this challenging year. I also want to thank Commissioner Trottenberg for her leadership over the past seven years. We were lucky to have had someone at the helm with her vision, passion for improving transportation options across the five boroughs, and deep expertise, and together we accomplished so much during her tenure. I know the whole department wishes her all the best in her future endeavors. Before discussing the legislation in front of the city council today, I want to acknowledge that 2020 was a difficult year for our city and country, and we all know the road ahead is challenging. The pandemic took lives of far too many New Yorkers, brought on an economic fallout that forced businesses to close and put many New Yorkers out of work. As Chair Rodriguez just stated, it was a very challenging year also for Vision Zero. During the unprecedented events of 2020, drivers across the city took advantage of emptier streets to speed recklessly, a phenomenon reported nationwide. Unfortunately, this trend in speeding had deadly consequences and contributed to an increase in motorcyclist and motor vehicle occupant fatalities, including many late night crashes with operators who were inexperienced or unlicensed and too often racing on our streets in unregistered vehicles. On the other hand, 2020 fortunately had record low pedestrian deaths, including the longest period without a pedestrian fatality since we began tracking fatalities by mode in 1983. And while cyclist fatalities are tragically still too high, the number held effectively steady last year, even as we saw a huge increase in cyclists on our streets, which translates to fewer serious crashes per trip. I am proud we continued keeping more vulnerable street users alive and safe, despite the significant operational challenges posed by the pandemic and the resource constraints of the city's massive fiscal crisis. We installed our highest number ever of new protected bike lanes, 28.6 miles. And we continued to expand the speed camera program, installing more speed cameras in 2020 than in the first six years of the program combined, with now over 1,300 speed cameras active across 750 school speed zones citywide. We also reimagined our streets to meet the needs of the moment. We created 83 miles of open streets to give people more space to socially distance and get outside. We established the open restaurants program through which over 10,800 restaurants have set up outdoors on the city's roadways and sidewalks. And we installed a record number of new bus lanes, 16.3 miles, to shorten commute times for the city's essential workers, many of whom travel by bus. Looking ahead, we will continue the, to follow the data in our efforts to make the city's streets safer. We will combat increased speeding with tools that are proven to be effective. Our latest speed camera report made clear what we already knew, speed cameras save lives. But in 2020, 36% of non-highway fatalities occurred in school speed zones during hours when cameras could not issue tickets, specifically overnight and on weekends. 
We must leverage this life-saving technology to the greatest extent possible. And as the mayor announced, the city is calling on the state to amend the speed camera law and allow us to keep cameras on 24 seven. And as the mayor said, we will have more to say soon on the aggressive strategies that we are employing as we continue expanding Vision Zero. Now turning to intro 2159, co-sponsored by council member Levin and speaker Johnson. This bill could create a new hazardous parking violation for obstructing a bike lane, bus lane, sidewalk, crosswalk, or hydrant adjudicated at oath, as well as a new citizen complaint system for these violations. Compliance with our traffic and parking rules is essential, whether by private, commercial, for hire, or government vehicles. Otherwise, our streets cannot effectively function properly for all street users, and safety, mobility, and emergency response can all be negatively affected. So we are always open to exploring new models to enhance safety and help our street designs function most effectively. We support the intent and creativity of the bill, but while it is an idea with understandable appeal, we believe it would be of limited effectiveness in ensuring compliance while requiring substantial resources on the part of DOT and our sister agencies to stand up and therefore oppose this legislation as drafted. We also have significant concerns about implementing such a program, and it would take much longer to do so than allowed for in the current bill. First, we have significant concerns about the potential that citizen enforcement could lead to conflicts between motorist and citizen complainants. For NYPD's TEAs, we know that despite the legal protection and authority of being uniformed agents, there are typically dozens of cases of assault filed each year. Under this program, people who are not perceived to have any authority would submit complaints, and we are concerned that this could lead to many verbal and physical confrontations, pitting neighbor against neighbor, causing personal conflicts and safety risks. Second, most parking violations are handled at the Parking Violations Bureau, and we believe that it is inadvisable to create a program involving parking, sum parking summonses that are adjudicated at oath, which could be difficult for the city to collect and thus not cost effective. As drafted and conceived, the bill raises legal and logistical questions that need to be explored further. Third, DOT is committed to a data-driven approach to all things under Vision Zero, from our street improvement projects, to enforcement, to education, by focusing on the locations and driver behaviors associated with the most deaths and serious injuries. This approach allows us to have the greatest impact and it builds in more equity by making sure the benefits of Vision Zero are not skewed to the communities that are the loudest or have the most community capacity to advocate for street safety. In contrast, we are concerned that while it would take very significant upfront effort for us to set this program up, the program would have an uneven impact, reaching some neighborhoods more than others. As we know, the city faces an ongoing budget crisis. We operate under severe resource constraints while at the same time stretching our capacity in every possible way. We must respond to the dramatic evolution of our streets amidst the ongoing pandemic while continuing to address the urgency of eliminating traffic fatalities and meet so many other demands on the agency. So we must prioritize our efforts toward the most proven, effective, and promising strategies. And regardless of the concerns we are raising, this proposal would require staffing, upfront IT investment, legal work to make rules and evidence guidelines for multiple types of offenses, as well as capacity and effort at oath, all requiring significant time to stand up. When it comes to enforcement of our bike lanes and other safety critical curb regulations, automated enforcement using bike lane cameras could be a very useful and powerful tool. As we called for in our Green Wave plan back in 2019, DOT is interested in exploring these applications and the possibility of obtaining the necessary state authority to pilot them. In conclusion, I want to thank the council for the opportunity to testify before you today. I look forward to working together during this final year of the de Blasio administration and your term as transportation chair, council member Rodriguez. I know together we will be effective toward our shared goal of safety while building on the transformative reimagining of our streets during this unprecedented time. We would now be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. And it's a great honor, as I said before, to be sharing this responsibility. We both, we never thought that starting my case elect in 2009 and you working, you know, being the Manhattan Commission and that we're gonna be ending today, you know, serving at this capacity. So I know where your heart is and I know that it, it, for the next couple of months, we still have a lot to do to address this epidemic. 
uh, even though we had to eradicate and we believe as New Yorkers and as a country, we had to let the science to guide us when it came to coronavirus. And, and we need to believe that we will, 2021 will be the year to come back to our feet and put a city back where we should be. And, and, and we know that we are dealing with that epidemic. However, we have the other epidemic, which is the one related to the numbers of pedestrians and cyclists, you know, being killed every year. It's something that we as a city have been addressing and putting a lot of tools in place. However, it looked like it had taken too long for us to be able to eradicate that culture that we inherit of so many uh, drivers committed hit and run, so many drivers you know, realizing that the street doesn't belong to them, that we have to share the street and not recognizing that from 8.6 million New Yorkers, only 1.4 million has vehicles and more than 7 million New Yorkers, they walk in every day. They rely on public transportation. So I feel again that we need to elevate you know, our work to be sure that we address all areas that contribute to fatality from cyclist pedestrians. So one of those groups that I want to uh, uh, get some feedback, some information for you is about trucks. And, and in that direction, I would like to ask you, and again, I'm not saying that trucks are the one that contribute to illegal parking. And of course, illegal parking affect the visibility of other people who are driving behind, therefore they can contribute to crashes. Uh, and I will, and my approach is about legal parking overall. Anyone that put the vehicles in the sidewalk, you know, uh, uh, anyone that park in the bus lane. But let me start uh, looking, trying to dip into trucks. Uh, approximately how many deliberate trucks are operating uh, all around the city at any given time? And have we seen an increase in the last couple of months? Yes, thank you, Chair Rodriguez. And um, we very much share your concerns about illegal parking that impacts street users and, and certainly trucks in particular. Um, prior to the pandemic, we saw, we don't have exact numbers on the, the numbers of truck deliveries, um, but we, have, we, have, we do have information. Um, prior to the pandemic, we saw about 60% of deliveries were for commercial establishments and about 40% were residential. Um, now during COVID, we see about 80% of the deliveries are residential with people staying at home um, and, and less commercial activity. Um, we have implemented, and I'll pass it off to Eric Beaton, our deputy commissioner, who's um, very deeply involved in all of our truck initiatives in a moment to kind of elaborate further, but um, we are taking steps to work directly when we have taken steps with the um, truck industry. One recent example is our expansion of our neighborhood loading zone program. This program seeks to stop trucks and other vehicles such as for hire vehicles from double parking in travel lanes, bike lanes, bus lanes, by giving them dedicated space at the curbside. Um, so we had started this program a while back and most recently um, last month, we actually extended the number of spaces and um, we're seeing some good success um, with that program. Um, we have also done targeted outreach to the truck industry and um, we're continuing to expand on that. Uh, but let me pass it off to Eric Beaton now who can give you a little more detail on our efforts. Thank you. Oh, can we unmute Eric Beaton? Thank you, and uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for all your, for all your words, and, and Commissioner Sportio. And, and as, as the Commissioner said, you know, we, we've been working very hard to, to work with the, the truck industry because we have seen an increase in trucks, particularly in, in residential areas. And we think that on the one hand, they're providing a tremendous service to New Yorkers, you know, where people who do, may, may not want to go out or can't go out are able to get uh, food and other necessities delivered at home and you know, is in a lot of ways, I think, allowing New York to continue to function throughout this pandemic. 
Uh, but on the other hand, it means that we are seeing more trucks in areas that were not necessarily designed for them, for that, that don't have commercial loading zones, that don't have places for trucks to legally get to the curb. Uh, and so we are seeing a lot of double parking and, and trucks uh, where we don't want them. But that's in part because we haven't created the space for them. So we, we, we want to sort of approach it from both directions, that we, we're working with NYPD and making sure that there's robust enforcement out there. But we also want to make sure that we're providing legal opportunities for people to get to the curb um, and trying to make sure that, that through our neighborhood loading zone, through regular commercial loading zones, we are providing those opportunities. Okay. Yeah, as, as the commissioner said, we have expanded the, those neighborhood loading zones from a small pilot that we started about a year ago shown really tremendous results in reducing double parking on our streets. And we think that most uh, truck drivers are, are trying to do the right thing. And when we provide legal space for them to get to the curb, they, we are seeing them use it, even if they have to use a hand truck to bring some of the, the boxes or deliveries part of the way down the street. So we want to continue to work with the trucking industry and make sure that people are able to get their deliveries we want to continue to provide space at the curbs so that those deliveries can happen legally. And working with the police department, we want to make sure that when anyone is not following the rules, they are being appropriately enforced against. Yeah. Commissioner, does a truck company or not company, delivery companies such as Amazon, when they've been adding these much larger numbers of trucks to deliver, of course, responding to the demand of New Yorkers uh, that now have been relying more or uh, ordering online and expecting that they will get the proto on time uh, when they place an order through, you know, a private sector such as Amazon. Uh, so it's not just about blaming on them, but with that increase that we have seen of more Amazon banning trucks throughout the five wars in the last couple of months, who has the numbers of how many more trucks has Amazon registered to you to you to be used for delivering a good in the city? And if that and and, and DOT has those number, what has been the increase based on the number that you guys have? Yes, Chair, we do not have the number of additional Amazon or other delivery type vehicles specifically that have taken place in the city um, during, during COVID times. Um, you know, maybe anecdotally, NYPD Chief Royster might want to add a little information to this discussion, you know, what they're seeing out on the street. Um, I don't know if Chief Royster has before, some additional... Before, before, yes. listening, before, before getting information from them, uh, who... Is DOT, who, who can have that information? Well, the, the trucks are all, you know, registered by their company with the state. Um, we don't we don't have that information. I, you know, I suppose we can, um, we have good relationships with many of the, the trucking um, companies. We're happy to talk with them and try to solicit some more information on the increased activity. So based, based on, on, again, it, it, the information I have right now, the city doesn't have, none of the agencies in the city, you guys, DOT, Consumer Affairs, anyone, is there any agency that get, collect that information? Right, my understanding is that we do not have an agency within the city that does it, again, because the vehicles are registered with DMV, that, that might be the place for us to go to to get some tangible information. Okay, I think that that's one, one of those areas that we should definitely look at it because it's like when the Muppets uh, rebel, that even though they at the beginning, they were saying that there was a lot of things that was under that the city couldn't do it. And even at some point we heard from the city that we were limited because they were raised from the department motor vehicle. However, they, in that particular case, they are you know operating in the city of New York. So even though I get that Amazon, UPS, and, and all those deliberate uh, company a, a institution, they are, they build cooperation on the DMV. However, the purpose of their use in this case for delivering, which is adding congestion to the city of New York, 
this is something that definitely I think that we as a city should identify the mechanism that we should be able to know, not to rely on the state agency to say, can you give us information? But we as a city and you should be able to know in accurate time, how many more vehicles are those company adding? Because it's no doubt. When I walk around, it can be Inwood, it can be Riverdale, in any place that you get to see. It's like the new everyday new Amazon band in the street of New York. So that for me is a trouble that we as a city, we don't have a accurate information on when new vehicles are added by those companies when they are contributing to congestion, when they are contributing to in, 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 in the, our environmental air contamination that we have in the city. So I hope that again, that we, that we identify that area as one of those that we should definitely close any loop if, if we have the opportunity to make any change for the city to centralize and get us information. On, on, on uh, fines and probably, I don't know, probably DOT, I mean, NYPD would be the one that had information. How many fines do they tend to accumulate for illegal parking? And do you know how many of those parking fines are for vehicles who were parked on bus lane and bike lanes? Good morning, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Good morning. Uh, and to the Transportation Committee, as well as council members uh, that are here today. Uh, I'm Chief Royster, as the as Commissioner Forgio mentioned. Um, I'm thankful to be here today and be afforded the opportunity uh, to share information with you. I was appointed to this position in October of, of last year to lead the Transportation Bureau, and I'm grateful to serve the city in this capacity. I believe that traffic safety is an intricate part of public safety, and I look forward to listening to our communities, working with the council, as well as partnering with our sister agencies to make sure all New Yorkers are safe, as you mentioned, earlier in your presentation today. Uh, when we start to look at uh, the number of parking summonses that were issued throughout the city, there were uh, at least 7 million parking summons that were issued in the year of 2020. However, when you start to drill down and look at the number of parking summonses that were issued to trucks, it was over 1 million parking summons and over 25,000 moving summonses, which are for traffic violations in uh, 2020. Do, do you know uh, from that million fine giving that they got in 2020, uh, how many of those, uh, uh, and of course, I know that OFF uh, probably is a entity that, you know, deal with those parking tickets but how many of that, those million dollars ended with those, uh, uh, the trucking delivery company paying those fines on how, or how many are still pending by then or their part of the agreement that they pay a percentage of those tickets? So unfortunately, Chair, I wouldn't have that level of information as it relates to the parking summonses that were issued. I'm not sure if, um, our other agency would? Yeah, the Department of Finance is the one who collects it. So we don't we don't get reports of how much money is actually collected for those million plus summonses that are issued. Okay. Uh, can you look at, if you have that information, what is the number in 2020 compared to 2019? If we had see if we saw an increase or decrease? So um, yes. So in 2019 we have over two million summonses that were issued to trucks, um, uh, parking summonses that were issued to trucks, uh, which is a decrease uh, for 2020, which is one over 1 million summonses that were issued uh, to trucks. And in the area of traffic violations, there were over 35,000 summonses that were issued to trucks compared to 2020, which is a decrease with the number of 24,000, over 24,000. Okay, and, and in general, besides including the truck, but as you share the 7 million that we have 
for all on uh, for all illegal uh, parking vehicles. Uh, uh, when you look at the general number, uh, uh, that number in 2020 compared to 2019, can you also share that number? Sure. So as we know, in 2020, it was a challenging time for all of us nationally, as well as within the department uh, and throughout the city. And we saw a 18% decrease in parking enforcement throughout the city. Uh, before I actually give you the number, if you don't mind, there are some challenges that we saw in the city as it relates to parking enforcement. One, our traffic enforcement agents, uh, we experienced a 20% uh, sick rate with our agents being out as a result of COVID. Uh, in addition to that, uh, more importantly, I lost 10 traffic enforcement agents as well as one tow truck operator and my predecessor during the uh, pandemic. So uh, that took a toll on our, our department as well as um, the Transportation Bureau. But in spite of everything that we were going through, we still continue to issue summonses uh, in the area of parking enforcement. So um, just to let you know, one of the things that we realized that throughout the year, even though there was a decrease, we saw in January and February, as we were issuing uh, parking summonses, we saw that that number increased in 2020. However, when the pandemic hit the city in March, we saw a gross decrease from March throughout the entire year. So uh, it's clearly there is a connection with the pandemic and what was going on in the city as it relates to parking summits. We, I also know that my agents were reassigned to hospitals as well as testing areas to ensure traffic flow and to make sure that it was fluid. Um, we just want to say that it, it's clear that the parking enforcement uh, that took place in the city was also related to the changes that took place as far as ultimate side of the street parking, which was suspended in March. And however, uh, it was a, a change in the actual rules in parking, whereas now uh, the parking is only, ultimate side is only on the last day of the signage. So with all of those changes, there seems to be a connection in the decrease in parking enforcement Throughout the city. And if I add one thing, in addition to those factors, there was also a noticeable decrease in cars on the road in April, May, June. I believe the data backs that up that with the significant decrease in the number of cars, there was a significant decrease in the number of parking illegally during that time. So it does make sense that a lot of our numbers on parking summonses would be down in 2020 versus 2019. Hey, Chief, what do you take it on? on the proposal on the ideas is suggested by Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams that in order to for the city to have more men and women in blue to be dedicated to fight crimes, NYPD should know how the men and women in uniform to be responsible to go out and give tickets, but that we should have another another uh, civil uh, the civil a uh, part of the NYPD or uh, all the entity be responsible to uh, go after the illegal uh, parking and not necessarily the men and women of uniform to be the one responsible to give tickets on illegal parking? Well, there are a lot of dynamics in looking at um, traffic and, and parking. Um, I'm sure this is a conversation uh, that will be something that all of the agencies will be looking at. I just think that the police department and is clearly and is, is clear and is evident uh, that the police department and our civilian members of the service are doing what we can to protect the city. I, I think that um, we are always looking at ways to make the city safer. Uh, and if that determines that some of the responsibilities have to be to other agencies, um, I'm not sure how that would work right now, 
but uh, I could clearly say that um, the police department is currently and, and will continue to make the city safe. Um, okay, thank you. And going back to, and, and, for, and thank you Chief for the great job and it means an honor to be working with you. And I know that all of us will stand on the shoulder of Chief Morris, someone that everyone will always remember him for being the big ambassador of the NYPD to go around developing good relationship between the police and the community. And I know that we all have good experience working with Chief Morris. So I know that all of you guys who are now responsible to, uh, for Convention Zero from the NYPD will have a Chief Morris presence in our life. But I, I also know that uh, you have a, a great background and, and, and I know that all of us will have new uh, important leaders to work together with DOT and the council and city hall to fight against this epidemic of uh, and pedestrians and cyclists losing their life because irresponsible drivers, unfortunately, they don't get that they need to share the streets and that the street doesn't belong to them only. So thank you for your leadership. Thank going you. back to going back to our uh, uh, in general, and, and I don't know if DOT commissioner is the one probably uh, uh, appropriate to answer this question. Uh, how is how are we doing when it came to uh, protect bike lane from a, a bike lane and bus lane? from uh, drivers that uh, leave those car, their car in those area. And probably that also can be the transition to uh, what you think about the bill uh, introduced uh, by Council Member Levin and Speaker Johnson. Yes, thank you. So as you know, we have a pretty robust bus lane camera program that has proven to be um, quite effective in reducing the violations um, in bus lanes. You know, there's always room to do better and to do more. Um, bike lanes, we have, you know, wherever we can, we seek to build protected bike lanes that are more difficult for people, um, for drivers to get into. Um, so that is always a goal to, to be able to do that. Do we need to do better on enforcement of, of bike lanes? We, we would definitely agree there's room to improve there. Um, as we mentioned previously in our green wave plan, we're very interested in automated bike lane enforcement. And I think that's something we're gonna give some serious thought to um, going forward. So I definitely wanna acknowledge that um, we, we seek to do better as a city in terms of enforcement to keep people safer. Absolutely. But all that being said, um, the, the proposed bill at hand does give us pause. We, we'd like to work with you further on it to see how we can um, go forward in a way that's more workable. But the way it's conceived currently is something that we do oppose. Um, first and foremost, we truly see um, a very concerning um, result of citizen on citizen assaults you know, verbal assaults, which are one thing, but most concerning physical assaults. Um, we know that every year NYPD has close to 40 traffic agents who are assaulted by members of the public. Now these are agents who are in uniform with a police department patch on their arms with the full backing of the police department, and yet they are assaulted. Um, we worry that with this program, you know, members of the public are going to see another member of the public taking a picture of their license plate or what have you. And um, that could result in, you know, split second violent confrontation. So we're very concerned about safety um, under this proposed bill. Um, okay. Secondly, it does require quite a bit of resources to step it up. We would need a very elaborate IT program so that when people, when members of the public submit violations, we know that they're being submitted correctly. So for example, um, in a bus lane, we'd have to establish that the car or the vehicle was there um, for a period of time because you're allowed to drop somebody off or pick somebody up in a bus lane. So we can't just take one picture. It would be more than one picture. We have to make sure the members of the public understand the parking regulations when they're submitting these violations. So we would need a really robust 
perhaps complicated IT system for people to submit complaints. Um, we would also need staffing and OATH um, would need some significant staffing for this. Um, two more concerns with the bill um, are that we think that the benefits could potentially be distributed unevenly around the city. Um, we don't know that they would that people would end up um, submitting violations in the places that we most need them to be. So you might have too much in one area and not enough in another area. Um, and lastly, returning the violations to oath um, do create some issues which we can expand on further. We have um, a deputy commissioner from oath, John Costelli here today, um, who can explain that if you like, but basically the oath violations are much harder to collect on. Um, and that calls into question even you know, whether or not this proposal um, makes sense financially. But that, that's sort of my um, overview and, and we can talk further about any one aspect of that. Okay, uh, let, let me take you two more questions in two area and then we call my colleague for questions. Uh, one, on, one is uh, on, on the liberal truck. Uh, I have seen more uh, uh, work being done especially around the east side, where we had to see like a center where uh, around 86 and 3rd Avenue, uh, the delivery the uh, company, they go in and mass distribution from there, like centralized distribution that from there, most of the, the order they are delivering in tricycle and bicycle uh, uh, so that it avoid reduce the number of trucks in those areas. Is that something that you, we expect to see how, how much progress has been made uh, uh, when it comes to identify, identifying area throughout the five borough where uh, Amazon, UPS, anyone uh, bring all those good delivering one to one area. And from there, uh, those uh, uh, delivery are made using tricycle, bicycle, or any motor transportation so that we can reduce trucks and, and, and reduce congestions. Yes, so we were very interested and, and we have a cargo bike um, pilot program that is currently underway. We can tell you a little bit more about, but we're very interested in seeing more deliveries happen via cargo bike. Um, the, the question becomes what you just described. I think you said 86th Street. If the truck that the, the bikes are replenishing from is in a spot like 86th Street and other trucks are coming to replenish it and then the cargo bikes go out from there, that is a cause of concern. I think we're much more interested in seeing the activity of replenishing the vehicles happen not in the congested neighborhoods, um, more outside of the congested neighborhoods. But, but it is a program with a lot of promise and it is something that we are working with the industry on. Um, if you'd like a little more detail, Eric Beaton can explain um, which companies we're working with in our cargo bike program and some of the results we've seen so far. So okay. why, don't, why don't we have Eric talk a little bit about that? Sorry, we need to unmute him again. Eric Beaton. We have somebody who can unmute Eric Beaton. There we go. Hi, hi, here we go. So yes, as Commissioner Porgeon said, we're, we're very excited about the potential for, for seeing more deliveries by, by cargo bites. And as some of you may know, we, we stood up a, a cargo bike pilot program uh, about a year ago. And, and since then, we've, uh, we've more than doubled the number of cargo bikes delivering on our streets, which we think is, is really terrific. There's certainly a lot more to do. But we think in a lot of these uh, you know, narrower residential streets, the cargo bike is a more appropriate vehicle to, uh, to deliver. And what we've heard from the delivery companies uh, is that a uh, delivery, a cargo bike can effectively carry as much as a truck because given the traffic on the streets, you know, the, the trucks aren't necessarily even always full. So the delivery bikes can be a, a, a very effective way of doing this. 
Uh, and, and we've worked with, with Whole Foods. We, we, we've been working with a lot of the big uh, uh, commercial package carriers. And we're, we're kind of seeing a, a consistent increase. And so we've been looking at what we can do to continue to encourage this, whether it's providing some dedicated space on the street where some of the loading happens. You know, that's not appropriate everywhere, but certainly in very busy locations. And Chairman, to your point, we've also been trying to find places where some of these transfers can happen off street. You know, that it's not necessarily in space that the city controls, but trying to work with some of the companies and some of the parking garages to try to find spots where some of those transfers might be able to happen outside of the public right of way as well. So we, we think there's a tremendous amount of potential here, uh, but you're also exactly right that we want to make sure that we do it in a way that it, that really encourages this, this clean and efficient mode, but does it without creating these sort of intermodal transfer hubs in the, in the middle of busy commercial streets. So we think there's a lot of progress there, but also a lot more to do. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. And, and Commissioner, yes, and Eric, let's, let's uh, follow, follow with our staff so that we can get more details about the evolution of, of that pilot project. Uh, uh, so that we can, you know, uh, get information, be able to be I helpful. Look to the bread, even though we did. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, my last uh, question at this moment is related to bicycle cyclists being killed. Uh, in 2020, as you know, it has been reported that there were at least 26 cyclists uh, fat fatalities in New York City. And if you can share with us a few questions, if you have them, and how many of these fatalities were the results of illegal park car? Uh, can you give us a breakdown by borough or where the cycle did occur? And has the city identified uh, any intersection uh, or road that are particularly dangerous for cyclists? And what measure uh, have been undertaken to make these intersections or roads safer for cyclists? Yes, so I don't have um, the borough numbers at hand. We can probably get them while we're talking and have them for you in a few minutes. Um, and I and we'd have to get back to you on which of those perhaps entailed a blocked bike lane. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about um, locations that we focused on. I'd like Eric to explain um, how we've chosen you know, our locations for both protected and conventional bike lanes in response to fatalities. Okay, thank you. Uh, now let me, sorry. Uh, yeah, maybe. Chair, yes. we do have the borough breakdowns. Um, if you'd like to hear it now. Okay. So Chair, when it comes to <clears throat> bicycle fatalities, which we know one fatality is too many, um, for the year 2020, we had 25, 25 bicycle fatalities. Uh, but when you look, break it down for boroughs, uh, the borough of Bronx mm -hmm. had eight fatalities that relates to bicycle fatalities. Um, Manhattan North had four. Uh, Brooklyn North had four. Mm -hmm. um, Brooklyn South five. Manhattan South two. We had no bike fatalities in Queens South, one in Brooklyn North, and one in Staten Island. Do, do you have, a uh, Chief, any breakdown of how many of those fatalities involve trucks? Right. All right, guys. Uh, 10 of those fatalities, the bike fatalities, involve trucks. Okay. Thank you, Chief. And thank you, Commissioner. Let me go back now to our staff so that they also, they can direct the council member in the order that they raise their hand who also has questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we uh, were joined earlier by Council Member Levine. Um, we'll now call on council members in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and he will let you know when your time is up. Uh, council member Minchaka will be first. Council member Minchaka. 
Yes, thank Anytime. you. Uh, thank you to the chair, uh, the members of this committee, uh, and and the DOT uh, for being here today. A Acting Commissioner, I want to say hi and welcome uh, to this work. This is this has been beautiful work uh, in the council, and and so welcome. Uh, thank I you, wanna, Council. I want to start with the first set of questions that connect to the cargo bikes. I see UPS is on this as well. Uh, and really bringing you to Red Hook as a, as a site to consider in this larger conversation about, about just focus on the bike lanes. Uh, earlier, I think you gave a, a lukewarm response to bringing more infrastructure, heightened designed and just more, more capital uh, um, investment in our bike lanes, thinking about them not as we have them today, but what we need them in the future and bike lanes could become an industrial, uh, uh, kind of industrial use with cargo bikes to be shipping some of our uh, cargo. Uh, and, and I'm wondering what's preventing you from, from really kind of uh, adding more support to thinking about them in, in different ways, both as, as, as commuters like myself who, who bike around uh, the city uh, and our cargo bikes, that's gonna require heightened design and focus. Yes, so, um, and I also look forward to working with you, Council Member Menchaca. Thank you for those words. So Thank I you. didn't mean to um, convey any kind of lukewarm um, endorsement of protected bike lanes. Um, this year, as you know, we did more protected bike lanes than we have any other year. We did 28 miles of them and we intend, or this past year and this current year, we do intend to do about the same number, hopefully a little bit more. Um, so we are very aggressively installing protected bike lanes, and that is absolutely the best alternative um, for safety on our streets. You know, to be fair, though, they do present challenges. Um, operationally, they're more to keep up if we have, you know, delineators or other devices protecting traffic from the bike the bike lane. Um, they present challenges in terms of maintenance for both snow removal and sweeping with sanitation. So we can't dismiss those other concerns. We're aggressively looking to be able to um, work on them better. We're talking with sanitation. They're pursuing more and more small equipment that helps them get into these lanes. Um, and we, we very much want to increase the number of protected bike lanes. Okay, so I, I'm looking forward to that and, and really looking forward to working with you and the team in something that uh, the previous commissioner, I think, really and finally understood the issue in, in Red Hook, where you have six last mile delivery uh, sites sprouting that is going to congest our, our streets. And if we just don't get, get that right, we're going to, uh, with really creative ideas like cargo bikes and, and bringing more uh, stipulation to uh, companies like UPS and Amazon and others, uh, we're, 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 we're going to create a lot more issues that are going to endanger pedestrians, cyclists, uh, and, and drivers uh, in Red Hook. Uh, you can answer if you have any kind of updates on that, but that'd be great. But let's just move over in the, the short time that I have on the, uh, on the enforcement conversation that this bill is asking us to consider uh, and civilians uh, versus versus agency support, and uh, and I want to kind of ask you to go deeper into this understanding that maybe some communities will have more more eyes on the streets, uh, and really moving to a civilian operation for for this kind of enforcement. Uh, I I just kind of want to get yeah. a sense about how how you're, you're you're thinking about that more deeply. Right. Well, well, we think that. Clearly, if the violation is $175 and the um, citizen gets 25%, that's sort of substantial. So we think that, you know, a whole sort of industry and workforce will spring up as a could spring up as a result of this proposed bill. Um, so I don't, we don't completely know how that plays out. Do they go to the neighborhoods? Do they, do they stay in their own neighborhoods? Do they travel to neighborhoods that they think they're good pickings on violations. We don't know, it's certainly not methodical. We do know that, right? Um, so we do think it would be uneven. It might not be in the areas that we have the most safety concerns. It might just be in more sleepy places um, that maybe were less, you know, less 
comparatively less concerned about those violations. We're concerned about all of them, but obviously on key major corridors, we're, um, we're more concerned about safety. So I don't know exactly how it would play out, but it won't be methodical. That's what I can say. Okay, uh, I'd like to come on to, to a second round of questions and, and maybe dig a little bit deeper on that on that front. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council member, if you, if you have other questions on that, you can ask them now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so just to, uh, again, I, the, the spirit of this bill, I think really begs us to have a, 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 a conversation about how we can bring in uh, a, a very material and a civilian uh, force. Uh, there are so many uh, cyclists like myself who are taking photos already and wishing they can do something more than just put it on Twitter and and and, and uh, shaming people, uh, and I think that that's part of the culture that the enforcement isn't there, so people are just going to get away with it, uh, and and so there there is an opportunity here to take a leap in co shifting culture that allows for communities, uh, and so I'm hoping that you can really sit down with us and and there's I think there's a lot of other ways that we can we can take this civilian response, especially when there are more people riding their bikes and they're riding in as families. And, and, and I think that there's, there's a way to really push the culture that, um, that we're seeing on the, on the streets, bringing in our community boards. Maybe we train our community boards to be part of this uh, uh, new civilian force. Our, our communities know which corners uh, are the problematic corners. Again, that shifts how we think about enforcement and I know that we have a big conversation around defunding the NYPD, which means that we don't want to put more uh, 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 work on armed humans in our streets either. And so uh, th this is this is the, the, the I think the response that we're looking for for DOT. And I'm wondering if you if you can uh, kind of take that and and uh, respond. Good. So I agree, people in their communities, they do know best and they have very good feedback to provide us. And obviously we take and NYPD takes in lots of complaints, but maybe there's a more methodical way of doing that, a more analytical way of like crowdsourcing all of the hot spots and the trouble spots. So we would definitely like to talk with you more and your colleagues about how we can better get feedback from people in the communities and totally agree with you. And would you be open to 311 being an access point for this? Absolutely. Okay, that's great. So we should bring 311 into this conversation sure. as well. Yes. Um, and the, I think the, the last thing I wanna ask is the, the ability for you or your team to give us an update about what, what's happening in Red Hook, uh, because it's gonna be a microcosm to other communities that are gonna see us sprout a last mile delivery. And, and I just don't think the city's moving fast enough to address these issues. Uh, until they're going to become, um, they will become. I can't hear you. You can flip to Rebecca if you want. Uh, they, they're, these issues are going to become issues that are going to take lives of New Yorkers, more lives of New Yorkers in our communities, like East New York uh, and some other industrial areas that are, are going to see a sprout of very dangerous last mile delivery. Yes. Okay. I'd like to ask Rebecca Zach to chime in on this as she has more. Hi, Rebecca. Happy New Year. Oh, we oh, need to unmute. You are muted. I, got, I got it. Okay. Hi, Happy New Year. How are you? Good. Good to it's see good you. It's good to see you. I hope your office and Renee and everyone is doing okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So I know we had that conversation that uh, Congresswoman Velasquez's office spearheaded. And I know that um, at that time, they were talking about kind of getting everyone back on the phone, multiple agencies, EDC, EDC DCP. Um, I don't know if there's been progress on that. Maybe it's time to touch base with them and see if, if there's, I know that the Congresswoman has probably been very busy the, 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 this year and into late 2020 and early 2021 with what's happening in DC. But I think we were, um, I think the next step from that call that we had was uh, them convening a, a larger call with multiple agencies, which we are happy to be a part of. And I think we'd obviously be um, happy to be having a conversation about cargo bike usage in that part of in that part of Brooklyn, um, I would say we'd be open to having any conversation about what kind of alternatives could be used in this area. Okay, so I, I just okay. want to say these are these are all connected components, uh, and it's both the Congress member and I that are leading this this discussion uh, as 
as a city representative for these agencies that we need to convene. So right. uh, commissioner, I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks council member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, council member. Uh, commissioner, I, give me one second, please. On my, my other question, uh, let me get back to some question on, 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 if you don't mind, give me one second, please. Uh, people people have the right, New York has the right to call 311 on, uh, you know, and for all the issues. Uh, how many calls uh, were made in 2020 related to illegal park vehicle in the city of New York? I mean, I'm referring to call to 311. Does NYPD have that information? Chair, I can provide you with the uh, number of 311 calls that were uh, made for um, vehicles, parks, and bike lanes for uh, 2020. Okay, if you don't mind. And again, if you can also always compare 2019 or a, a, whatever a universe you can cover, that's important. Very well, I'll start with 2019. In 2019, we had approximately 17,851 calls uh, for vehicles parked in bike lanes, um, uh, 31 calls. In 2020, however, we had 8,369. Uh, call. That's a decrease in 53% of calls for vehicles parked in bike lane. To add some level of specificity to that, in January and February, uh, we had the highest number of calls in 2020. And from March on, it seemed like uh, the calls uh, for 2020 for vehicle park, vehicles parked in bike lanes decreased. Dramatic. Okay, thanks. And another question probably that to you guys from the NYPD chief is related to the numbers of NYPD car illegally parked in the surrounding area of the prisons. And again, myself, as someone that anyone know, that have been organizing since I landed in New York City in 1983, have not been shy to say we need to address any issue of police brutality, uh, any issue related to make the men and women, the NYPD accountable as anyone that all, of, of all of us that serve the government should be accountable too. No one should be treated different. Uh, uh, always also understand that our responsibility is also to provide a, you know, make the men and women the NYPD accountable. And at the same time that we need to provide them all the resources that they need in order to do the job. So I'm not questioning the need that, you know, the men and women has in order to park the vehicle, you know, when they go, when they come to work, to the prison, especially those of them who live in area uh, that it doesn't, transportation this area that they need to drive. But one of my questions is, how can you, what is it, what is the city doing to address the overpark vehicle around prisons that we see today? Like, I don't get to, I know the, I know the best, math is not my background, but when I look around and see, and based on the information that we have with local inspectors or friends of all that, you know, that they, for you guys at the NYPD, that also are inspectors or sergeant or captain in different prisons throughout the five borough. I don't get to see why there's so many cars parked in the sidewalk in the middle of the street around prisons. So what is, what should we expect seeing or what has been done to address the abuse of use of a street space around present by some members of the NYPD. So you're absolutely right, Chair, when you talk about um, uh, parking, uh, whether it's our emergency vehicle or our private vehicles around our uh, facility, our police facility. 
well, one of the things I like to talk about is that we are leaders in the community, we serve the community. So if we are parking illegally uh, or if we are abusing our authority to park, what it does is erodes the trust that the community has in the police department and more importantly, in the officers that serve that community. Uh, so it, when you have a so, certain culture, uh, what you wanna do is to invoke change. And uh, throughout the time we have been instructing our officers uh, as well as our members of the service and our facilities about parking illegally, double parking, bus, park, bus stops, or whether there is a, a bike lane in front of that facility. And we've done that through messaging, but we realize that messaging just does not uh, reach everyone. So we've also uh, identified supervisors, as you mentioned before, that will be accountable. And, and the way we do this is through previously our traffic stat, uh, which is responsible for addressing traffic safety issues, which parking is a traffic safety issue. But we more importantly address the executive officers in that precinct. And that's going to continue under our traffic safety forum, which will be done every month where we bring in executives and talk about some of the traffic safety uh, issues that we're having, not just with the community and drivers and motorists, but also our members of the service, because we have to continue to be leaders in the sight of the community. Uh, we want our, our executive officers to be held accountable. I hold those traffic safety forums and I am going to drill down on the fact that this is a culture. We will continue to uh, inform officers, but not only inform, we will uh, actually take in consideration the information that we're receiving from 311 as well as the community. And I have a outreach team that will go out and look at the infrastructure of that precinct to determine uh, what we need to do internally to make sure that officers are not parking illegally in front of the facilities or around the facility. And may I also say that in each of our 77 precincts, transit districts, as well as uh, housing of, uh, facilities, we have lieutenants that are our integrity or our sergeants that are our ICOs, our integrity control officers. They are responsible for cir circulating information as well as doing observations every tour to instruct and make sure that officers or civilian members of the service are not parking their vehicles illegally. Uh, going forward, Chair, uh, for the year 2020, in addition to all these steps that we are taking, we're also going to make sure that there is signage inside of our facilities to address the infrastructure that's in and around the um, police facility so that officers will be aware of where they actually are not supposed to park, as well as instruct them and, 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 and additional training. So this is something that we've, I'm going to continue to monitor with not just the Transportation Bureau, but also the other units within the police department. Our Chief of Department's Office, our Patrol Services uh, Bureau, which actually oversees our officers or any other bureau within the department. This message will be amplified going forward. Yeah, I just think that zone assessment I'm happy to hear that I think the additional assessment must be done about what is the numbers of parking spots that each person need. Because what I feel is that, it, and I get it, it, I will assume that the person has some it, it, it numbers of vehicles you for undercover operation. I get that those persons also need to have it, it, others, you know, it, they have other need, but let's say in, if in a ex prison we have let's say 250 police officers, uh, in no time, half of them work at the same time. 
and sometimes you pass by or drive around those uh, some of those prisons, and you get to see so many cars part taking blocks around prison, say, taking this the the sidewalk, and it's like uh, all the time. Uh, uh, all, all police officers are working. I mean, all. I know that it's not only about those with uniform. I know that there's also the civilians. I know that there's also the, the detective. But I feel that an assessment must be done because when I look around through some prisons, it's like hundreds of parking spots taking at the same time. So uh, uh, if there's not a plan or any assessment, I think it is important. I think that the council should be reported on what, how many parking spots uh, are needed in each prison so that working in collaboration with you guys, we can have a better understanding of the use of parking spots around prisons. I, I agree, Chair. I think this is something uh, uh, that assessment that uh, you were mentioning, I think that is something that uh, the police department as well as the Department of Transportation, when we start to look at the infrastructure of each of our facilities, uh, we need to have a discussion about and determine uh, what is feasible and also uh, what is necessary as far as the parking of our emergency vehicles so that we can safely respond as well as park and make sure that the community is, is not um, actually um, troubled by uh, the parking situation that's around our facility. So, uh, Commissioner, so what should we expect in 2021 when it comes to, uh, you know, not only I know that all of us in your case, we follow the step of former Commissioner Polly Trumbull, uh, to whom we have a lot of respect. And, and, and I can say I only have a good thing to say about her when it came to her leadership, and we all as a one, a good luck on whatever uh, she will decide to do in the future, hopefully at the national level too, which will be a great access to the city of New York if that's what she will decide to do. But in your leadership, what should we expect? Because this is about leaving our fingerprints. We all have to continue as parents we are, you know, doing the work to be a role model to our kid, but also we want to expect that the future generation will do better than us. So uh, uh, what should we expect in 21 when it comes to you as the leaders of DOT for them, at least for this couple of months, starting in this couple of months, to see how aggressive will we be when it comes to uh, addressing illegal park uh, happening in, in New York City? Yes, thank you, Chair. And, and I share your feelings um, very much so about Polly Trottenberg. We accomplished so much the last seven years um, with her at the helm. Amazing work that um, it's, a, it's my largest priority to continue that, that good work and take it further. You know, for 2021, first and foremost is safety. As we've been discussing this morning, um, 2020 was not the direction of Vision Zero that, that we wanna see it go. Um, so I think the largest thing that we need to focus on is doing much better for Vision Zero in 2021. Now, everything will be overshadowed by the continuing pandemic. Hopefully in the coming months, we'll start to see that abate and things will get more back um, or somewhat back to what they used to be, um, you know, in our lives and on the roadways um, in terms of some of the negative effects of the pandemic. But, you know, we at DOT will be juggling our work. We've done, you know, a tremendous amount of work with open restaurants and outdoor learning, um, open streets, open storefronts. So we'll be continuing that work um, this year as long as we need to. And some of those programs, as we know, um, we really want to see them last in, um, far into the future. But throughout all of that, we also need to really... Um, double down on what we can do with Vision Zero. So right now we're in um, pretty um, deep discussions about what else we can do this year. And in the coming weeks, um, I think the mayor mentioned this a week ago, we will be talking more about the specifics of what we can do in 2021 for Vision Zero. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and Rebecca too, and let's uh, have conversation on 
the possibility of doing some level of our, our Earth Day celebration. Uh, and it, of course, I know put you, you know, guy in the spot right now to say, can we commit to do it now? I know that this is something that we were not able to do it because of the COVID-19, but hopefully with the vaccine and, and the city coming back, you know, in place, uh, uh, probably we should look at the possibility to do again our uh, Earth Day celebration on, on April. So uh, if, if you don't mind, let's, you know, let's touch base in another conversation to, to see how- Yeah, we I, I know that the state guidance is gonna dictate a lot of, a, a lot of like the size of gathering. And right now that's suspended, I think until the end of February, I believe, but we'll confirm, you know, it's, it, it's been a thought here too, obviously. Because mm -hmm. April's April's right around the corner, but mm -hmm. we'll, yeah, well, happy to talk. And, and, thanks. And, and commissioner, in non uh, illegal parking uh, related issue, but on on the on 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 the uh, scooter pilot project, are we on time to uh, uh, for that? Is that is that pilot project uh, planning continue moving, and should we expect that what? It, of course, like I know, I'm not expecting that, you know, for you to pull out information, but it, I know since your team been working with this, if you can share with us if, how, what are we with the status of the, of the pilot project for a, a scooter? I know that March is important. And, and of course, I'm not talking about disclosure information that is only you guys discussing with, with those who respond to the IFP, but it's about timing wise. And of course, I started saying that I would like to see, you know, the pilot project coming out, you know, moving forward as March being important. So can you update us with some information on regards to that? Yes, so we are doing well um, in terms of our schedule. We're, we received the proposals um, maybe three weeks ago. Um, we're currently evaluating proposals. We got um, a good number to work with. And in you know, the next um, weeks or a month or so, we will be able to talk more publicly about next steps. Okay. So we're, we're doing well, we're on track. Thank you. And, and my, my last, the last item that I want to address you on non bike a, a, on a matter that you think we're working very close and I appreciate what they're doing, which is about the bike lane uh, on on along along 181st uh, Street, uh, 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 one idea is, and again, uh, this is something that I know in the past, in your previous role as a Manhattan commissioner, I think that you were familiar with something that has been mentioned in the past that I would like to see, you know, how you in the in the new role and working with a team that are having that the team that is having the meeting. There was one last week with a stakeholder of this community to take the feedback about it, how do we move forward and be showing that 181st is included as part of the new vision for buses. And sorry, what I say by lane for buses right. in, 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 in uh, along 181st. One idea is, can we, and again, I'm not putting a spot neither, it's for you to look at it uh, because you have been mentioned in the past. I think all buses that, come from the Bronx to Manhattan to 181st, they should stop in the Bronx side at university and have a shuttle buses that go along 181st all, all, all up, up to Fort Washington. So that instead of having the four buses, lane 13, 36, coming to Manhattan, they should end their university and having a shorter buses, I think they will help us big time for us to reduce the congestion of buses coming to this area. So again, at the community board, this is something that I've been I've brought in the past. I have not brought to the stakeholder meeting. And, 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 and but if you can also, you know, look at it, and, and I'm more than happy to continue this conversation with the team that you had this, uh, assigned to work with this. I'm more than happy to continue, but I feel that it will help us big time. Sure, we'd be happy to talk with you more about that. We can get our team together with the MTA and talk through it. Okay. Good. So from my end, I don't have more questions. I don't know if Council Member Levin has been able to join us, uh, but I see Paul 
So, Ed, you are bringing back to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilmember Levin, if we have you now, uh, would you like to give remarks on your bill? Yes, sir. Um, uh, and I want to thank uh, Chair Rodriguez. I want to thank um, uh, the commissioner. Uh, my apologies. I was on a um, uh, I was, uh, delivering a, uh, a remarks on a conference. So my apologies for my lateness here. Um, just want to take a moment here to to uh, speak on on intro 2159 um 2159 came about as a result of years of unaddressed placard abuse this is not the first step this is not this was not the first step solution or the second but years of agencies failing to keep our streets free from obtrusive and harmful parking has made this bill a necessity i've gotten thousands of calls from constituents over the years who have watched vehicles use bike lanes and bus stops, bus lanes as parking lots. In fact, uh, I, I get uh, uh, calls about uh, uh, cars using travel lanes uh, as parking lots. And agencies blatantly ignore the law. And it has, um, it has grown to be um, a persistent um, um, an endemic problem. Uh, we cannot let people who use placards be held to a different standard and it's time for some accountability. This bill takes a pragmatic and responsive approach to a longstanding and entrenched issue. It provides community members with the tools that the government has had but not effectively used for years. Intro 2159 does not prohibit agencies from enforcing parking violations. DOT and NYPD can continue issuing violations and towing vehicles at any point if they are worried about equitable enforcement. Um, <clears throat> I've waited for enforcement on placard abuse and extreme parking violations for years, and it hasn't happened. And we cannot continue to wait, especially as we put in place more dedicated bike lanes. More bike lanes only work when they're actually able to be used. Um, the fact is, if we continue to allow parking abuse to go on unfettered, we are not doing our jobs as government officials, and it is irresponsible to continue to do nothing. Um, and, you know, I, it, this is not obviously just limited to, uh, to those holding placards, um, but in areas around, uh, particularly in downtown areas around the city, um, you know, it is, it is so clearly um, a double standard of enforcement, um, and frankly, it's there's I have I have you know after years of banging my head against the wall. I mean, we've just landed at a at a point now where um, uh, I'm not confident that the that the administration has or the police department has an answer. For you know, I, if, if in other, so, I guess my, my question is um, uh, to the commissioner: if if this isn't the the solution that um, that the that the city wants to pursue, um, what then is the solution that the city is putting forward? Because um, you know, it is. I mean, all you have to do is go anywhere in down in my district in downtown Brooklyn. J Street, Artillery Street. Don't even get me started on the on the uh, ramps on and off of the BQE. And frankly, it's it is just it's you know you don't even have to have a placard. You just have to have some indication that you're a member of the uniform service in this city, and you will you will be exempt from getting any type of parking violation. And I will say this: I'm a city council member. I have a placard. There, I, I'll give you an example. There, outside of my district office in uh, on Atlantic Avenue, there used to be a no standing four to seven, so it was clear for a travel lane. This was on the south side of Atlantic Avenue, and um, uh, there would be times I was in a meeting, I would forget, uh, I would, and I would realize to look up. It's, it's a quarter after four. I'd run out to move my car, and my car would be towed. And that happened several times. I had my car towed to the Navy Yard multiple times 
I stopped driving you know, work, but, but, uh, when, um, but, uh, so it's not as if it's just placard holders because I had a placard in the window, but I was parked illegally in a no standing zone. It's that, I, it's that it's uniform personnel. If you were indicating that you were a uniform personnel, there's a, there is a, a code of um, solidarity between uniform personnel. Uh, maybe DOT's uh, 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 lumped into that and you know, DOB, uh, cars as well but you know it doesn't just go across the board and and it's just there's I just have heard no solution in 11 years in the council that the administration has put forward to how to address that issue so that's why we are where we are today okay. sorry so thank you council member we understand your frustration um, and I'll pass it off in a moment to Chief Royster um, to speak more specifically about law enforcement but um, as I mentioned earlier, a few things. One is that we're very interested in automated bike lane enforcement. Um, we've been very successful with our other camera programs um, for enforcement, and we'd really like to advance that um, in the future and hopefully in the near future. So that doesn't necessarily specifically address um, placard abuse, but it would include that. Um, so that, that is one thing that- Does that, um, Would that require state legislation? Yes, it would. Is yes. it on our agenda in our state? Um, uh, is, it, is it part of our state agenda, for state legislative agenda for well, this session? We've recently begun talking about that now, so it is not yet on the state agenda. But we would like to, okay. to talk with our colleagues more about, about that. Because the, the clock is ticking there. I'm going to be out. And you guys are, you know, not, maybe not you, but the the Vlasio administration is going to be out. Um, we don't have another state legislative session after this one, so Correct. if, it's not, right. if okay. it's not done this year, then I don't, you know, I, I you know, right. I will have, it, I won't have any part of it, you know. Understood. Right. It's something we raised in our Green Wave plan um, a year or two ago, and and it is something that we think has a lot of promise. So. Um, we'd like to make sure we have those discussions. But in terms of enforcement in general, we believe it's very important to take the discretion out of enforcement. That's why we've been working with NYPD over the last few years to move to a license plate reading technology for enforcement. So the way it would work, and we're about this year, we're starting to modify all of our 14,000 parking meters to be able to accept license plates for enforcement. And the way it would work for placards is that any given vehicle that is legitimate to have a placard would be included in this system, in this database. And it doesn't mean you can park anywhere as you're pointing out with the placard, but it tells you that that vehicle is legitimate. And by only having, by not having a physical placard in a windshield, you prevent people from lending their placard to somebody else, using an outdated one instead of turning it in as they're supposed to, it eliminates a lot of abuse. So we are moving in this direction with NYPD. NYPD is um, getting new devices for their agents to be able to better utilize um, this new technology. So in the next few years, this is the direction that we're moving in and that will also help address um, some of the placard abuse. Uh, so I don't know the, if she, the purpose of yeah. this legislation, though, specifically is to um, uh, to crack down on dangerous parking. It's not, you know, it's obviously it's not just all, um, uh, you know, it's not all parking violations. It's not overstaying at the meter. It's not um, uh, even parking in all no standing zones. It's 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 specific to um, to to the kind of parking that requires other users of the road to, to put themselves into on, uh, incoming traffic. I mean, you know, a, a bicyclist, a, a, block, a blocked bike lane means you know, you're going into, and we've seen tragic results. There's a, a young woman um, uh, who, uh, on Central Park West uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, but, it, but it's, you know, as a cyclist myself, you know, you're kind of putting yourself in, you know, you're, you're um, Putting yourself at risk when you have to go around a parked vehicle in a in a in a bike lane, um, and uh, similarly with uh, pedestrians having to walk around uh, parked cars in, um, in crosswalks. And so, um, what's the? I mean, I because I'm not quite sure what what is the 
I, I placard or no placard, what is the what's the enforcement plan? I mean, what's the I don't, I don't I'm just like I'm, it's kind of one of these things. It's like a big it's like a big open secret in the city that um, you know that you won't get a ticket if if you're you know seen as like you know as, as, as if it's somehow you're part of this code that doesn't get tickets. Okay, I mean, at this point, maybe Chief Royster wants to talk a little bit more about the initiatives within the police department that they've been pursuing. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Hi, Chief. Um, uh, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, so there were a couple of um, measures that we've taken uh, previously as it relates to uh, parking. One of the things that I, I'd like to mention, and we mentioned before, is the overarching thing is safety. It's safety for our most vulnerable road users, uh, our cyclists, our, our uh, elderly, uh, our people, our community that's walking on sidewalks. And we will continue to make sure that our officers are aware that parking in areas like this is, is a safety hazard. But one of the things I'd, I'd like to uh, share with you today is that uh, the conversation and given instructions to officers is just not where we're going to stop. We know that this is a, uh, a cultural thing and we are going to change it and we're going to uh, work with all of our um, units within the department to make sure that message is down to the lowest rung on the ladder. Uh, it is a issue in our community. It erodes the trust in our community. And um, the one thing that we are going to do is make sure that our leaders are held accountable in the precinct to make sure that it's not done. Um, I, I just want to say that Every year, uh, we issue uh, placards, uh, restricted parking permits to our members of the department. That message is going to be amplified when they do get parking permits. One of the things is that there are rules that go along with these permits that they get. Uh, the rules are very clear. Uh, they are not to violate the rules. They are not to park in locations where they're called safety car safety hazards. The other thing is that we are going to look and make sure that there isn't a pattern of this being done. Um, you know, instruction is one thing, holding someone accountable is another thing. But if a person is found to do this, we're going to make sure that we revoke those permits. Um, we issue them every year, as I mentioned before, and there is a process in doing so. Uh, the misuse of a placket is very important to us. Uh, we don't take it lightly. Uh, we will continue to work with all of our units within the police department, and we will continue to do external outreach to other uh, law enforcement agencies to ensure that they know the importance of not parking in bike lanes or bus lanes or you misusing plans. Thank you, Chief. I, 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 um, I appreciate it, and I do look forward to um, so working with you on all of those initiatives, um, and uh, and I I appreciate the, the work that you put into this. Um, you know, I I do think that at a certain point, um, you know, the purpose of this legislation is to um, is to uh, give citizens, everyday people in the city, um, uh, you know, that agency to be able to. Um, take action themselves, um, and it, it's you know it's it's reflecting you know a level of frustration over the years. Um, so I I uh, I do look forward to uh, uh, working with you. Um, uh, I know you're you're relatively new in the position, so um, uh, you know there's there's I think opportunities to be had, but I um, we do want to move forward with this legislation. But I I, I will uh, be in touch. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to the chair. I appreciate uh, everybody's patience. And uh, I know that my colleagues have, have 
ask numerous questions as well. Well, with that, uh, Council Member Levin, will, unless uh, Elio has somebody else, I think that we're coming to the end of question from Council Member, both Chief and Commissioners. Uh, it is an honor to be working with you. I know that this is a tough time, but I also know that we have uh, the responsibility to continue working around Vision Zero. Yes, we can save life. Yes, we can reduce to zero the numbers of New Yorkers who lose their life as a result of crashes. And I think that having the great leadership, in this case, by both of you as a chief in the commission, and we're working with City Hall, Speaker Johnson and the colleague, we will accomplish this goal. So with that, thank you to the administration. Thank and now you. we'll go back to Eddie. Thank, thank you, you very much, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we'll now turn to public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Uh, so there, there's no need to use the raised hand function. We will call everyone uh, who is signed up to testify. Um, please begin, oh, each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Um, and if your testimony will run longer than two minutes, please summarize. Uh, please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Um, our, our first panelist today will be uh, Marco Connor Diacqua. Marco. Starting time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for convening this hearing, and uh, Speaker Johnson and Council Member Levin for introducing this legislation. Uh, my name is Marco Conadiaqua, and I am Deputy Director at Transportation Alternatives. I'm testifying today in support of Intro 2159. Um, I also want to urge the Council to pass another bill, Intro. 1141 by council member Konstantinidis to reform the stipulated fine abatement program for commercial vehicles obstructing pedestrian and cyclist right away. That bill 1141 has more than a majority of council co-sponsors uh, and it is long overdue to bring it to a vote. Um, in 2018, Madison Jane Leiden was killed while riding her bicycle in the Central Park West bike lane, but she was forced uh, in to traffic um, by the driver of a large truck uh, because of a car driver uh, who was parked in her right of way and she was struck and killed. This is precisely the type of reckless behavior that this legislation aims to address. And for every person like Madison, hundreds more are injured from the exact same dangerous parking behavior. Um, vehicles illegally blocking crosswalks, bike lanes, bus lanes, and sidewalks is a problem that is rampant throughout our city. And it's something that the administration has not remotely addressed with the seriousness it requires. The proof is in, uh, or the proof of this inaction is, is right before us on every street where pedestrians and cyclists are forced to walk into dangerous traffic where drivers' sidelines are obstructed, limiting their ability to see pedestrians and where transit riders are unacceptably delayed. And the proof is in the absence of Madison, Jane Lighton, the fact that she's no longer here, that is the proof of the utter inadequacy, uh, inadequacy of this city and prior administration's um, efforts to date. Um, I want to also highlight how illegal and dangerous parking affects people using wheelchairs in many ways, when already limited ADA compliant sidewalk curbs are blocked by vehicles parked in the crosswalk, it forces wheelchair users who are pedestrians under state law to travel in the vehicle travel lane next to multi-ton lethal vehicles to the next intersection in the hopes of being able to ride onto the sidewalk there. And these are just some of the many ways illegally parked cars cause real harm and create unacceptably dangerous conditions throughout our city. In addition, it harms how we feel about using public space. Already more than 75% of our street space is reserved for moving or storing for free 
private cars and trucks with pedestrians and cyclists pushed to the margins of the road. Um, when cars then occupy additional space by blocking sidewalks, side, um, bus lanes and bike lanes, um, space that is reserved for vulnerable road users, it sends the signal that these streets are not for you if you aren't in a car, that you're not welcome here. And when our city fails to enforce against that behavior, it says that our city, our mayor and government do not care about us feeling safe and free to move around in our own city. These are spaces that should be sacred and not free for all parking spaces that harms New Yorkers. Um, Operating a large multi-ton vehicle comes with a tremendous responsibility, including not speeding and also not creating hazardous conditions like parking illegally. We are generally cautious of enforcement um, measures, of new enforcement measures, but this proposed law creates a civil, not a criminal fine and would not result in more officers on the street. We all have a responsibility in operating large multi-ton vehicles to do so with extreme caution in ways that do not harm our fellow New Yorkers. And if you can't do that, then a civil fine is appropriate to deter that behavior. Um, finally, to help ensure this law's fairness, we urge you to consider a fine structure that uh, perhaps starts with fines lower than $175 a warning for your first offense, followed by escalating fines for subsequent violations, and also ensuring that these violations never lead to warrants being issued. And these are just some of the ways that, that we can address some of the concerns raised. So there is also precedence for this citizen enforcement in the form of the city's idling laws administered by the Department of Environmental Protection, a structure uh, is, that's already in place and can easily be emulated to quickly implement this proposed law. Um, so in, in closing, thank you, Council Member Levin, for advancing this, um, Speaker Johnson, and thank you, Council Member Rodriguez, for your steadfast, life-saving leadership in advance of Vision Zero and livable streets for all New Yorkers. Uh, transportation alternatives, we support this legislation and we urge its passage and enactment as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? I just want to thank Marco for his leadership and no question at all. We know that you are a great partner on all the effort that we take at the council to save lives so for pedestrian and cyclists. So thank you. Okay, um, our next panelist will be John Orcutt. Uh, John. Uh, hi, council members and, and uh, Chair Rodriguez. Apologies, but I'm having some technical issues with video, so um, okay. it may be just voice only, but I'll be quick. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank um, Council Member Levin and Speaker Johnson as a co-sponsor for his bill. Um, Bike New York strongly supports uh, the intro in, in uh, instituting citizen enforcement of parking. Um, as Council Member Levin said, um, it's just, it's, it's ubiquitous. We, ha we have a completely out of control, illegal parking situation that's been allowed to develop and deteriorate for decades in this city. And we need measures to take it back. Um, I wanna point out that, you know, the DOT and the PD um, discussions today had really no analysis of that problem. They were just talking in general and kind of off the cuff to oppose the bill with very little to, to offer, um, which is especially uh, maddening for uh, an agency like DOT to come in and say, you know, we're data driven in all things, but they've never admitted that there's a problem with chronic parking in bike lanes. Um, so they've never looked at it. They don't have a solution because they've met, they don't really study it. And to say that we can't have a solution because it may be, in, in, you know, we may have some more citizen activity in one place than another is really, um, you know, just kind of throwing in the towel on this thing. Um, so really appreciate the council's continued policy leadership in the, the vacuum left by the de Blasio administration. Um, <clears throat> having said all that on the issue of parking enforcement, um, I do want to say we're, we're kind of astonished that we could have a hearing on cars and trucks and bike lanes for going on several hours now that has not even once brought up the issue of bike lane design. Um, we, we have what the city calls protected bike lanes 
and the city celebrates as more and more protected bike lanes all over the city, um, but they're not designed to really protect cyclists from cars and trucks. Cars and trucks get in the protected bike lanes on a regular basis. Um, you know, you don't need our daily experience with that. City uh, Hunter College studied it and said, you know, for every 10 block stretch, we find three, three cars in bike lanes. That's just students going out and, you know, writing down what they see. It's a huge problem. And the bike lanes that we have today uh, are not solving it. Um, the, the practice of moving cars off the curb to, um, you know, to create a third space on the street, parking protected bike lanes, those are working for the most part. They're, they're better than we have. They solve problems at intersections. Um, but the plastic sticks protected bike lanes are just not protected bike lanes. Cars drive over them. The plastic sticks are designed to be driven over by cars and trucks. Um, there are a variety of issues with how you solve this. Cities all over the world solve it and they, and they do it. And it takes leadership from the top. We're really looking to some of the mayoral candidates to uh, to probably save us from this because you know it wasn't heartening to hear. Thank you, John. Um, City DOT saying you know our plans for next year are stay tuned. We'll let you know. Um, but anyway, thanks again. Please pass um, Councilmember Levin's legislation. Thank you, John. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next panelist will be Sean Adair. Sean? Hi there, I hope you all can hear me. Um, my, my name is Sean Adair. I'm going to read my prepared statement first and then uh, the ongoing uh, testimony that I've heard so far has also alerted me to a number of other very specific issues which I feel I'm familiar with. My name is Sean Adair and I am a member of Families for Safe Streets and I'm here to strongly support the Bill 2159. I know firsthand the dangers of illegally parked cars. About three, three years ago, I was riding my bicycle on First Avenue Bicycle Lane um, near 21st Street when a truck was illegally parked in the left turning lane, um, forcing other vehicles to, to pass around it in a, in a very difficult intersection area, blocking all visibility between me and turning traffic and um, a car swerved around this truck and stopped to, you know, for pedestrians in that area, you know, abruptly in an area that, that caused me to, to uh, crash into this, into this car. Fortunately, it was not, this was not a, a dangerous uh, um, accident. Um, however, I wasn't so lucky a year later uh, when a, a car for hire went through a red light, hit me from behind giving me lasting injuries. Um, and part of the reason why I've become very, very passionate about uh, safety on the streets. Um, I actually live on the East-West bicycle corridor of 12th and 13th streets in Manhattan. And I use these bike lanes on nearly a daily basis. Um, it's this welcome, but very different kind of lane that is especially prone to vehicle interference. Um, this is one that could be called a protected bike lane, but it's not really. There are some plastic pylons that trucks just run over um, that car service circumvents. Um, and it's a particularly dangerous area uh, because if you do leave this area, the street is, the remainder of the street is extremely narrow. It's actually more dangerous than, than sharing that, that space. Um, when I go out and, and look and down my street, there's always a vehicle um, in the bicycle lane, regularly requiring me and other cyclists to ride around the park, uh, car or truck and putting us in danger. I've had doors open in my path from both delivery and car service vehicles, which use this no stopping designated area as a free for all pullover zone. Um, and some areas, uh, there are regular service trucks parked illegally throughout the day in the bike lane, for instance, near the Verizon Depot, what, 13th Street and 2nd Avenue. Um, that does, there's no effective um, enforcement of, of, of this. Um, there are also NYU vehicles that park in, in the lane um, between 3rd and 4th Avenues um, on 13th Street. The result is anyway, that it's more dangerous than <laughs> it was sharing the road in many cases. Um, and I've complained to parking enforcement officers that I've actually seen there who don't seem to be willing 
to address uh, this type of infringement. Um, if someone is in the vehicle, say a, a car service or, or a delivery truck, they, they do not want to address the, the, the safety issue that's taking place there. Um, you know, they might ask them to move, but I don't see any fines taking place for this type of thing. Thank you, um, Sean, you could summarize. One more, one more quick issue is that I'm a member of the Citizens Reporting for Idling Commercial Vehicles. Um, this has been a successful program. It was one started by George Packenham. And um, I think it's been one that's been very successful to the city. So there is an existing pilot program for citizen reporting of street addresses. This is specifically for commercial vehicles and um, I, th um, I, th I think everyone would find it successful. Thank you. Uh, do any yeah. council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, our next panelist will be Melody Bryant. Melody? Time begins now. Hi, my name is Melody Bryant and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets. I'll be reading the statement of Amanda Berry, whose daughter Madison Lydon was killed on Central Park West for reasons that have already been described. Amanda couldn't be here because she lives in Australia and the time difference. It's been my honor with founding member Dana Lerner to take care of Madison's memorial bike. We adorn it with photos of Madison and her family, poems they have written, her diploma, ribbons they have sent with messages for her. We take photos of the bike and send it to her family in Australia so they know that Madison is not and will never be forgotten. This year she would have been 25. This is her testimony, Amanda's testimony. I still cannot comprehend that my daughter Madison is no longer with us, no longer gracing this earth with her infectious laughter, her inner and outer beauty. Maddie was so loud and clumsy, she asked so many questions. Her thirst for knowledge was unlimited. I could talk forever about her endless qualities and her zest for life. Madison was 23. She had saved up for the trip of a lifetime and traveled from Australia to see the world. She went to so many islands and countries, Japan, the Philippines, and then most exciting, America. She had just graduated with honors after studying psychology for four years, and she wanted to do so many things with her degree to help people, but she didn't get the opportunity to even apply for the master's program she had hoped to attend. Madison was killed in New York while she was cycling in a bike lane on Central Park West. She was hit from behind by a truck driver after swerving out of the bike lane as an Uber driver was parking in it. Her best friend Pam witnessed the whole thing, but she could only scream. I relive it in my mind constantly and have regular nightmares, always worried that she suffered. Since the crash that claimed her precious life, I became severely depressed and suffer from PTSD. I'm not the only one suffering a lifetime without her. Her dad, Andrew, was terribly broken, as well as Madison's three siblings, a big brother and two sisters. Paige is Madison's identical twin sister. They were meant to be together always. Madison also has a huge family and a huge network of friends and colleagues, and so many are suffering because of her death. Our hometown lowered the flags to half mast in her memory. Pam now has had that horrific event shape her in ways we will never know. You don't just pick up the pieces no matter how hard you try or pretend. Our friends and family can see we are just not the same anymore. We never will be. The what ifs always go through my mind. What if that Uber hadn't been in the bike lane? My daughter would have been safe. If only he hadn't moved back when he saw her. If only he hadn't been there in the first place. I hope my daughter and so many others who've been killed and injured because of the dangerous act of parking in a bike lane is forever present when you consider this new life-saving bill. Sincerely, Amanda. Families for Safe Streets has joined with others to fight tirelessly to change parking in bike lanes. And for the first time, because of Madison's death, Central Park West has a protected bike lane. But even with this, drivers still park in it bicyclists need more protection. A civilian reporting program which both finds abusers and incentivizes reporting will, we hope, be a solid step in ensuring that bicyclists are truly protected in New York and that no other family will have to suffer such a loss. Families for Safe Streets strongly supports this life-saving bill. It cannot pass soon enough. And I want to thank Council Member Levin for his leadership in advancing it. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, first of all, I, I just wanna remind everyone to try as best you can to keep your uh, testimony to two minutes. 
Um, you are also welcome to submit written testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And I, I apologize for having to cut people off. Um, our, our next uh, panelist will be Axel Carrion. Axel? Box stands ready. Good afternoon and thank you to Speaker Johnson and Chair Rodriguez for holding this important hearing on illegal parking and bike lanes and the opportunity to testify today. My name is Axel Carrion, Vice President for State Government and Public Affairs at UPS. As UPS looks to expand its cargo bike operations in New York City, in coordination with New York City DLT's e-cargo bike pilot, we appreciate the city's efforts to expand the bike network and reduce conflicts between cyclists and vehicles. UPS invests millions of dollars in safety training every year, and UPSers have collectively spent nearly 6 million hours in training classes. Over 10,300 drivers nationally, and including many of our drivers operating here, right here in New York City, have earned UPS a circle of honor distinction, meaning they have not had an avoidable accident in over 25 years. Our commitment to safety goes beyond our own fleet as well. As members of the Together for Safer Roads Coalition, the UPS Foundation is proud to help underwrite the installation of backup cameras, convex mirrors, and side view cameras for City Harvest, New York's largest food rescue organization through the Vision Zero Tech Fund. Further, UPS utilizes technology to increase efficiency of our routes and reduce the number of vehicles on the road. However, training and technology alone cannot solve for the fact that as more residents and businesses rely on e-commerce and deliveries further amplified by COVID-19, legal parking positions for final mile deliveries have not kept pace with demand, making our streets less safe for everyone. However, there are steps that the city can take in short order to address some of the root causes of illegal parking and increased safety for cyclists, pedestrians, and drivers alike. First and foremost, UPS supports increased enforcement to ensure that existing loading zones are reserved for those making commercial deliveries and are not simply area for four hire vehicles and private cars to idle. Second, we encourage DLT to review all permanent and temporary changes to the streetscape holistically. When commercial loading positions are displaced by construction activity or infrastructure improvements, DLT should identify alternative positions to allow for expeditious delivery. It is time to rethink our curb space to make New York City streets safer. UPS has put forth a slate of proposals that we believe will increase street safety and reduce illegal parking, including a pilot program to dedicate loading zones for low emission vehicles, expand the use of locker systems to reduce re-delivery attempts and increase the maximum allowable time for commercial parking to reduce the chances of conflicts between cyclists and vehicles. UPS appreciates the opportunity to work collaboratively with the council and DLT to identify and implement solutions that move our city into a safer, more sustainable future. UPS hopes that the city will continue to partner with us and other logistic companies to opportunities to make delivery safer and more efficient. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Yeah, Axel, that proposal that you mentioned is, is something new or is this a, a document that you have shared with us in the past? Uh, it is a document that I have shared uh, working with DOT, Chairman. So if the or you guys also can send it to us to look what is uh, those proposal, it will be good. Absolutely, Chairman. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Levin also would like mm -hmm. to ask a question. Uh, Mr. Carrion, a, a quick question. Um, and I'm sorry I, I, if, if, if you would mention this in your testimony. How, um, how many spots do does UPS or you know UPS and FedEx and um, uh, uh, or the overall kind of delivery uh, 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 companies? How many spots around the city do they feel are short right now? Um, it, I would say more in the commercial zone, the DOT has done a good job, as they mentioned before, expanding some residential oh, yeah. parking. 
Um, yeah. the, the COVID-19 pandemic councilman has, has definitely, council member has definitely um, changed the landscape of our uh, delivery percentages as far as residential and commercial product mix. Whereas it used to be 60% to 40% give or take commercial mm -hmm. to residential. Uh, during the height of pandemic, we were looking at some rates of 85 to 15, even 90 to 10. Uh, so yeah. we've, we've seen a, a, dramat, a dramatic uh, change in uh, parking needs for our residential areas. But I, I will note there were many comments made earlier, council member, as far as uh, the number of tickets going down. And there, there is some truth that there was uh, um, less, I guess, traffic enforcement officers on the road or dedicated to uh, ticket issuance. But I will, I will subscribe that I make the argument that it was more to legal parking just being available. Um, so I think uh, working with the city, one of the focuses that we've been trying to hammer out is taking a look at holistically, instead of from the street to the curb, from the curb to the street, uh, there is illegal parking definitely taking place every day in our city streets. And the question is, if we still have final mile deliveries that need to be made, where are those parking positions? Yeah, no. Place. Absolutely. And I, I don't think you get a lot of argument uh, from from a lot of us in the council that, um, you know, the only if you know, there's only you're looking at a, a, a pretty fixed pie. And so, uh, you know, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of a lot of a lot of elected officials, you know, we have if, if we're taking if we have to take parking away from kind of uh, unfettered on-street parking, that is, I am entirely supportive of that. And I mean, I've across the board, you know, if there are, you know, we all are ordering Amazon, we are all ordering um, uh, things online um, and not just because of COVID. COVID has changed that, but I don't know if that's gonna be going back in that other direction anytime soon. And and so, you know, the 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 kind of on the on the on the uh, hierarchy of priorities, um, you know, people's need to park their private vehicles on the street is the lowest priority in the hierarchy of priorities. Sorry, so you know that needs to be done aggressively in this city because we can't. The status quo is just not acceptable. Of just basically, because I know UPS and FedEx have like a a kind of system with the city where you guys pay this you know a certain amount up front and 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 then have have uh, tickets dismissed, but that's not that's not a workable solution. And it, I mean, again, I understand the needs of you know your drivers. You can't you need to park somewhere in order to get the packages off the truck. Uh, but uh, and I'm all in favor of having you know bike loaded you know last mile delivery. But that's you know there's some limitations to that. The I mean again the hierarchy must go safety and then you know uh um uh, accommodating um commerce uh and and then and then the last priority has to be you know the ability of people park their car for free on the street you know uh all the time so yeah i agree and and we do reserve a great interest in the safety of bike lanes uh because as i mentioned in testimony we are looking to have a significant part of our operations that are cargo bike related. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to bike lanes, we have an interest in making sure that the bike lanes are rolled no, out. And I, and, and I get it, I get it, but I've been to your distribution facility in, um, in, uh, in Queens, like, you know, there are, there's in that parking lot, there's gotta be uh, 700 trucks or something like that. I mean you know, we're not going to be totally getting, you know, we're, we're not moving entirely out of trucking from, from UPS and FedEx. That's just not happening. But I mean, I appreciate that. And the more, the better, but uh, yeah. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next panelist will be Rocco Lacertosa. Rocco. Box stands ready. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and the rest of the committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rocco J. Lasertosa, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the New York State Energy Coalition, better known as NYSEC. 
LISEC serves as the voice of the renewable uh, biodiesel and heating oil industry in the five boroughs of New York City and Nassau and Suffolk County. Today's hearing will involve a broader discussion about the issues of illegal parking and bike lanes throughout the city, but I would like to focus my testimony on intro 2159, which we believe will negative, negatively affect the impact of the way our industry operates. The heating oil industry is well into the 2020-2021 heating season, and we are already seeing cold temperatures and winter conditions in the city. As a result, our members are working harder than ever to deliver consistent service amongst a number of obstacles. Furthermore, given the pandemic and the increasing number of people who are working from home and residing within the home for longer periods of time, the demand, the demand for heating oil has, has been higher than ever. It should be of no surprise to the members of this committee that delivering any type of essential service in New York City has become increasingly difficult given the expansion of transit infrastructure improvements and such as dedicated bus lanes and the proliferation of bike lanes in neighborhoods throughout the five boroughs. The heating oil industry, however, faces a unique set of challenges as we are unable to park just anywhere when conducting our deliveries. In almost all cases, our fuel trucks must park as close as possible to the customer's location, whether it be commercial or residential, in order to access, to the, access the point of delivery uh, to the fuel tank. Thankfully, our delivery personnel take on average 15 to 20 minutes to complete a fuel delivery, depending on the size of the tank, with a maximum of 30 minutes in some specific cases. As the city implements more bus and bike lanes to improve the transit system in New York City, our members have had to adapt their delivery options to fit the current landscape. However, some of our members have reported customer locations where they have no physical way of delivering fuel without temporarily occupying a bus or a bike lane. It's important to note that our members go out of their way to ensure that their vehicles are complying with all New York City parking and traffic reg regulations, but the legislation being proposed today could make things significantly more difficult for our members. As written in 2159, we'll create a new civil violation punishable, punishable by, by up to $175 for parking a bus lane or bike lane within a radial distance of 1,320 feet from an entrance uh, or exit of a school. Many of our members serve not only the Department of Education, private school facilities, but also a number of residential and commercial customers whose locations would fall within that distance. As such, the legislation poses a number of concerns for our members, and we look forward to working with the bill sponsor and the council to address these concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Council member Levin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Lasertosa. I, uh, I, we spoke uh, earlier in the week um, as you reached out, or last week, um, and um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm understanding of the concern um, because um, uh, there's um, obviously uh, from the issues that you pointed out. So um, we will continue talking, um, and I'll. Uh, 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 engage with the individuals, um, the advocacy organizations that have uh, been testifying here as well to kind of talk through how how we would uh, address the specific issue of of, um, of of home heating oil delivery um, and, uh, and 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 that very narrow kind of category of um, uh, where there's you know uh, for example. Um, also utilities where there's a street work happening and things like that. So um, thank you so much, I appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you for the time. Thank you, um, if there are no other questions, our next panelist will be Eric McClure. Eric. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair Rodriguez and Council Member Levin. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Streets PAC strongly, uh, I'm, my name is Eric McClure. I am the executive director of Streets PAC. Um, we strongly support intro 2159. The reporting mechanism called for in the bill is modeled on the Department of Environmental Protection's Citizens Air Complaint Program, which works the same way for island violations and a bit like the TLC's complaint system, which does not pay a reward. Both of those programs are considered successful and allow the city to increase enforcement of harmful behavior without burdening law enforcement personnel. Illegal parking is rampant in New York City and in too many cases creates hazardous situations for people using the streets. One of the most tragic recent examples was the death of Madison Jane Lydon, which my colleagues have talked about extensively. 
And while in such incidents of illegal parking happen thousands, if not tens of thousands of times every day, they are reportable to 311. However, existing enforcement efforts are severely lacking. It often takes hours for police to respond, frequently well after the violator has driven off. Worse, in too many cases, police fail to take action when they do respond. Not only will intro 2159 help hold those creating dangerous street conditions accountable, but it will in many cases free up police for other tasks. Ideally, we'd like to see the bill advance without the quarter mile restriction since illegal parking can create danger anywhere. I'm not sure, for example, if there is a school within that radius from where Madison was killed, but we support this legislation regardless. The concerns expressed by the administration can be addressed. We urge the council to reconcile these concerns quickly, vote intro 2159 out of committee and pass it into law at the earliest opportunity. Of course, this legislation alone won't eradicate the rampant problem of illegal parking and bike lanes. We strongly support the use of bike lane cameras and will gladly work with the administration to help advance legislation permitting their use in Albany. However, the best way to address the problem is to design and build bike lanes that can't be parked or driven in. Too many of the city's quote unquote protected bike lanes are only protected by flexible plastic posts the drivers too often flout. A bike lane should only be counted as protected if it can't be driven in, which means hard physical protection in the form of parking protection, jersey barriers, or curbs that can't be mounted. We also strongly support expansion of the city's pilot neighborhood loading zone program. We urge that the program be expanded widely and made permanent. Finally, it's imperative that the Department of Transportation release its overdue smart truck management plan without any further delay. As the number of truck deliveries continues to soar, the potential to overwhelm neighborhoods with truck traffic. In Brooklyn's Red Hook, for example, there are at least four e-commerce distribution centers planned, all as of right, in a neighborhood whose old cobblestone streets are ill-equipped to handle the onslaught. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. I look forward to seeing you all again in person at some point soon. Thank you, Eric. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, uh, our next panelist will be Glenn Bolofsky. Glenn? Clock stands ready. Yep. Well, good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Nice to see everybody again. Um, thank you to uh, Speaker uh, Johnson and um, Chairman Rodriguez. I'm very happy to be with everybody today. And I want to thank uh, Council Member Levin for introducing this bill and all the co-sponsors of the bill as well. Um, I support this bill uh, to protect the safety of our community. I mean, too many lives are lost uh, every single day, every week. It's, it doesn't end. It's got to end. You know, we have to do more. We deserve more. Our families, our friends, we all deserve more. I know DOT has restraints, have complete respect for their efforts, but we still have to do more. I not only support this bill to protect the safety of our community, I second the support of Transportation Alternative transportation alternatives and others to not only support this bill, but for um, intro 1141, 2018, which will end the stipulated fine program and generate as much as 300 million a year in revenue that we all desperately need for the new budget. With more than a majority of the members on the bill and the package delivery companies enjoying windfall profits, they really should do their share and pay the same fine as everyone else. I think we, uh, it's time we start calling this the fair fines program because of the social inequity and the social injustice of people who are out of work, uh, trying to put food on the table um, and having to pay uh, sometimes five or six times the uh, price, a multiple of five or six times than the largest companies who enjoy the use of our streets. They enjoy the use of our streets for record profits they should need to pay a fair fine. Uh, regarding DOT's testimony earlier that they did not know in, in answer to Chairman Rodriguez's question. Uh, Tom, uh, yes. Or just please summarize. Summarize, uh, DOT should have a mechanism to know every vehicle operating in the city. And the last point, um, is most of these parking problems can go away in literally one minute. If DOT just quickly amends its rules to say that no standing any time zones should be no standing except trucks loading and unloading zones, which would make parking a truck, making a delivery legal. They don't need to change the sign to spend any money, just change the law and they could 
put four to uh, seven to seven or something like that uh, that would help UPS, FedEx, and everyone else. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Glenn. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none at this time. Um, uh, our next panelist will be Paul Schreiber. Paul? Fox stands ready. Hi there. Uh, my name is Paul Schreiber. I live in Councilman Lem Council Member 11th District in Brooklyn. Uh, I am here to speak in support of the bill. As a cyclist and pedestrian, uh, it is not a day goes by that I am out for a bike ride where I do not have to avoid a vehicle parked in a bike lane and put myself in danger by riding into oncoming traffic. I would like to make uh, two additional points here. One is there are a couple of ways to improve the bill. The fine of $170 is too low to start and it should increase with subsequent fines. Uh, and secondly, the, the restriction on being within 1,320 feet, which I looked up in is one mile, uh, is uh, unnecessarily limiting and should be expanded to protect all bike lanes everywhere. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to bring some data to this discussion. Of the 8,245 blocked bike lane complaints filed to one in 2020, only 109, sorry, 100. That's 1.3% of them resulted in a summons. 76% of these complaints resulted in no action and 19% resulted in the police took action to fix the condition, which is unclear what that actually means. Um, so if the NYPD thinks that 99% of complaints are unfounded and don't require a summons, then something is really, really wrong here and we need to figure out what that is and fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, our next panelist will be Michael Dunn. Michael? Yeah, present. Um, I'm gonna read a prepared statement and then I'm gonna try and uh, share my screen to just share some pictures of what I'm talking about. Uh, hopefully that works, we'll see. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Dunn. I'm here to ask some questions about the NYPD and their parking placards on Classen Avenue specifically. Uh, Classen Avenue has a lovely park, a playground, and a school, PS270. It also has an NYPD precinct, the 88th precinct. Uh, the 88th precinct has decided that the laws of the city of New York do not apply to them. They have painted uh, parking spaces onto the sidewalk of class and avenue. These parking spaces are labeled XO, patrol lieutenant, ICO sergeant, etc. cetera. Uh, these spaces are assigned and clearly maintained with the full knowledge and endorsement of every command level within the building and beyond. Indeed, the ICO sergeant is the integrity control officer. Uh, that is the person who is responsible for the placards and that every day they are parking on the sidewalk. Uh, these spaces are clearly in violation of both the city charter and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, by habitually parking on the sidewalk, the 88th Precinct demonstrates a flagrant lawlessness and poses an active threat to the health and wellness of the surrounding community. Um, I've personally witnessed New Yorkers in wheelchairs who have been forced into the street uh, because of these vehicles parked on the sidewalk. Um, placard abuse may seem like mundane corruption, but the lack of accountability and civilian oversight contributes to a culture of lawlessness that permeates the NYPD. NYPD comes to city council and they lie. They lie about placard abuse. They lie about their disciplinary process. They lie about bail reform. They lie about the New Yorkers who they shoot in the streets. They are not good faith participants in this process. They are not seriously trying to fix their culture. They relish the privileges of the placard class. They said they would do nothing different about the protests earlier this summer when they beat us in the street. The NYPD operates outside of civilian control and they are a lawless gang and city council would be wise to start treating them that way. I'm tired. That's fine. I will share my screen and show you the pictures of the- uh, uh, Michael, we, with, without- oh, okay, so It's just a bunch of pictures of the cars outside the 88th precinct. Okay. Uh, I'm, part, I'm, and I'm, it's all my 311 complaints that have been falsely closed uh, saying that the police was department responded and it wasn't necessary. And then the last thing I'll say is about the automated enforcement of bike lanes. 
uh, it's illegal to have a license plate cover in the state of New York, but there's a lot of NYPD officers who have license plate covers on their cars. So if you're going to do these automated enforcement, it's still going to be inequitable. Fuck the fucking police. Cheers. Okay. Um, I would just like to let everyone know that if you would like to submit any kind of written testimony or anything like that, you can do so at testimony at NYC, uh, at testimony at council at nyc.gov. Um, our next panelist will be Michael Streeter. Doc stands ready. Hi, I'm Michael Streeter. Um, I, I'm from uh, Councilmember Levin's uh, district. Uh, I wanted to speak in support of Intro 2159, which is modeled after the DEP's anti-idling initiative. Um, both of these bills were drafted to address laws that are constantly being broken all day, every day, all over the city, which despite years of begging and pleading have been ignored by NYPD. I want to make two, uh, use my time to make two quick points. Uh, number one, regarding safety of civilian reporting, uh, there have been just over 18,000 complaints submitted to the DEP's idling program in three years. And I personally am responsible for nearly 1% of them. Each submission requires that I walk around a vehicle with the phone pointed at it for over four minutes while the driver is in their vehicle. I have not experienced any incidents with drivers, nor have I heard of any physical confrontations from the many other complainants that I speak with. I suggest that anyone uh, concerned about safety actually examine incidents stemming from reporting idling trucks or uh, TLC or 311 complaints uh, instead of making assumptions like we have heard argued by uh, DOT this morning. My other point uh, regarding the potential of this uh, proposed uh, bill um, the Island Complaint Program has made a huge impact on truck driver behavior in very little time. Uh, I can only tell you about this firsthand anecdotally, but I have a clear before and after perspective. In, in 2019, uh, on a lunch break in Midtown, in one hour, I recorded five idling trucks just while walking to a bookstore and back to my office. I submitted five videos, five summonses were issued, five hearings were won by the DEP. Less than two years later, that's not happening anymore. Truck drivers know what's going on. They have changed their behavior. There's still plenty of idling, but it's not at that level anymore. And it's thanks to crowdsourced enforcement. So every day I see cars illegally parked. Um, it's, time. it's time to allow us to finally hold them accountable, just like we were finally able to hold polluting truck drivers accountable. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Hannah C. Hannah. Starting time. Hannah, All right, sorry, um, I was having a little technical difficulty. Is it me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to get a couple things to happen at once. I know I'm burning time, just a moment. Um, okay. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Hannah Carlin. Um, I'm a lifelong New Yorker, Brooklyn resident. Um, I, I don't have a prepared statement. I found out about this hearing and just decided to make time for it, um, not realizing how much time it would be. Um, I I'm passionate about this issue for a number of reasons, but um, chiefly because my uh, friend Sarah Pitts, who was an activist and a Brooklyn assistant district attorney was killed on her bike on her way home uh, in September. Um, a, a vigil space has been built where this happened on Wythe and Williamsburg Street and every single time we're there, there are buses in the bike lane. There are private buses, there are private transportation vehicles every time we go, about half the time we go, there are also police vehicles there because they know that it's a dangerous intersection. And when we ask them to do something about the bikes, they do nothing. They tell us that they're not gonna do anything. We get, I don't know what to tell you every single time. Um, it's awful that we have so much data about bicycle safety and infrastructure and death, but I feel like it shouldn't actually take a death tally to see that illegal parking of this type is dangerous and that protecting illegal parking of this type makes space for injury and for death. 
I get that it's a burden on businesses. What you're asking is to make space for people to get hurt and killed. Um, the intersection of White and Williamsburg is a perfect example. It's a dangerous intersection for a lot of different reasons. The illegal parking is one of those reasons. Um, but you know, you have to solve the whole thing. They've sent they, again. They've sent police there because they know it's a dangerous intersection. It's not enough. It doesn't solve it. Every piece of this puzzle has to get solved. Um, I want to speak very, very quickly just to, I think the notion of an IT system worry is nonsense. I think repeat offenders are ridiculously easy to document and a simple upload recording of an empty or idling vehicle would be easy enough. Um, I think the school radius strikes me as a totally needless restriction. This danger is everywhere. Every single person on this call knows that it's everywhere and we know that it needs addressing. And lastly, I want to thank in particular Councilman Menchaca uh, for working really passionately on this issue. Uh, for doing it with an eye to its intersections of race and class and for showing up for Sarah on multiple occasions. Thank you, Councilman Menchaca. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, our next panelist will be Ian. And if you could just please say your name for the record. Uh Hi, uh, my name is Ian Robertson, and um, thank you so much for your time today. In 2019, I was almost crushed by an MTA bus, which broke the law, and it almost killed me on a sidewalk, hence my interest in traffic safety. Um, Vision Zero and the current traffic laws and enforcement are simply not working. There are hundreds of millions, and I do repeat, hundreds of millions of traffic violations in New York Traffic violence is out of control and has destroyed many lives, polluted our neighborhoods, gridlocked our cities and endangered especially our young and old. The police union has publicly acknowledged the problem and the inability of the police to now address this. As a result of my near death experience, I actually proposed a new law um, to New York City Council based on both my experience in DEP and in TLC. Um, drivers break the law for one simple reason. NYD cannot enforce the law given the scale of violations. Yet an army of citizens is willing to assist New York City to make the streets safer in our neighborhoods. Citizens working towards Vision Zero. I've dealt with both the DEP and the TLC. I can tell you that in the last year I've managed to have convictions of over 100 taxi drivers without a single failure. It is a simple photo to the TLC. It is a very simple and easy system to do. Um, in the eight years of Vision Zero, let's be honest, the issue of traffic violence has simply not been addressed. People are still dying. People are still being injured on a daily basis. And I'd like to make one offer to the council today. I fully support this law, but I have proposed to the council already a law that is exactly this law. I would like to make further proposals that within one year would reduce the deaths by 50% in New York City at no additional cost. The current laws and technologies could be enhanced to end traffic violence. It's simply a question of political will. Finally, I'd like to thank sincerely um, the council members for bringing this bill and for giving me the time to talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, testimony. Um, do any of the council members have questions for this panelist? Let's just be sure that it, we keep his contact so that our staff also can follow with him on that, on what is the ideas on the law that he are referring to as a potential one to introduce. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Our, our next um, panelist will be Kyle Gusk. Kyle. Starting time. Hello. Um, Good morning. Uh, I'm going to read from a prepared statement today. Um, 
I'm a resident in uh, Williamsburg, uh, District 34, and I've taken cycling as a form of exercise, recreation, and transportation for the last two years. <clears throat> Grand Street in Brooklyn, which is supposed to have protected bike lanes, is both a major through fare for cyclists and large commercial vehicles. But every time I ride there, there are vehicles parked on just about every other block. This forces cyclists to ride with large commercial traffic, which is very dangerous and prevents newcomers from adopting cycling in the city, which is so important, especially during the pandemic. This happens every time I ride here and I've never seen a single vehicle ticketed. Of course, this phenomenon is not limited to Grand Street, but occurs across our city. I observe way too many cars parked in the bike lane, endangering the lives of cyclists. This means there's not enough enforcement. Many of these vehicles are here for a short time, so regardless of the will of the NYPD to enforce parking the bike lanes, they may not be equipped to do so. Moreover, their enforcement will is questionable because nearly every precinct has both police and private vehicles parked illegally on sidewalks and bike lanes. Short, short of fixing our infrastructure to prevent these scenarios, which should be our North Star, we must act now and provide an avenue of enforcement to save lives and encourage cycling, a green, socially distant, and healthy form of transit. I have many friends here in New York City who express interest in cycling, but are hesitant for safety reasons. We need to move forward with every reasonable effort to increase cycling safety to the point where everyone who wants to cycle feels safe cycling in our city. Currently, there is no mechanism to report these parking issues that carry any accountability. 311 will close the case and it will not be investigated. Constituents must feel empowered to make their streets safer. I'd like to thank the council for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Dimitris Kutumbas. Good afternoon. I want to thank you. I want to thank the chair, council member Rodriguez for holding this hearing, speaker Johnson and council member Levin for introducing this bill and the opportunity to testify today. My name is Demetrius Kutumbas. I am a resident of Washington Heights and biking has been my main mode of transportation for getting around since moving to the city a couple of years ago. It's been very rewarding to see the positive changes happening on our streets to the benefit of safety and slower travel speeds. But in most times, these changes have been happening reactively. The city has not done enough to proactively encourage its citizens to try alternative modes of transportation. Through my experiences, I can clearly say that many drivers do not see a reason to share the street with anyone but themselves. It's very discouraging and infuriating for bicyclists to continuously see double parked vehicles along St. Nicholas and Amsterdam avenues, the only two major thoroughfares uptown with dedicated bike lanes. The culture needs to change and it all starts from leadership at the top. I am a strong believer that if you design proper streets for the needs of all users, enforcement shouldn't be required. I can say that through my experience, the NYPD has done a terrible job in enforcing drivers to obey the rules of the law. They should not be in a position of enforcement when they themselves disregard the safety of bicyclists and pedestrians through blocking bike lanes, blocking crosswalks, blocking sidewalks, and converting blocks into parking lots. I do not understand why police officers need to patrol their neighborhood in the comfort of their SUV when and New York City is extremely walkable. It is bad for community relations, the environment, and the safety of other users of the street. I have also been an avid user of the reported New York City app, which provides a simplified way to submit, submit feedback to 311 and the TLC Commission regarding any infractions by drivers on the road. I have many times submitted photographs through the app, which allows the TLC to prosecute drivers and if guilty, pay a penalty. Even though this is a terrific app, I do not have any direct incentive to keep submitting evidence of traffic violations. Uh, closing this bill introduced today would benefit all citizens to proactively engage with government and help with revenue the city desperately needs. I understand that this should not be the only solution to our problems. The city has to start looking at the transportation system holistically and recognize that in order to properly implement Vision Zero, government should not rely on enforcement, but adequately engineer its streets to the benefit of all users. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? I would like to thank the ministry, a former intern in my office, a resident of our community, 
someone that I know have a lot to offer today and someone that not only is putting his idea on the table, but someone that I, I know that we will continue hearing from his amazing ideas on how to focus also urban planning and bring solutions to transportation issues that we face. So thank you for being a resident in my district for the year that you serve as an intern. And I know that the city will continue listening to a lot of good ideas coming from you in the near future, especially on transportation. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist will be Lucia D. And if you could just say your name for the record, please. Hi, yes, my name is Lucia Deng. Um, I am a resident of um, the Bronx up in, on the Grand Concourse in Fernando Cabrera's district, it's 14. Um, I am in full support. Thank you, by the way, for the opportunity to speak on this. I'm in full support of the bill introduced by Council Member Levin um, for a lot of the reasons that everyone else had already mentioned. Um, in particular, you know, it, it's every day I observe um, NYPD and other city officials parking their cars on the sidewalk median, right on the Grand Concourse. I mean, it, it's it's unsafe. It prevents um, emerging traffic from seeing folks riding in the bike lane. Um, it's unsafe. They're parking right on top of subway grates. Um, and I think the biggest thing is that it, it essentially sends a signal to others that it's accept acceptable to do this. Um, and it completely erodes the respect, trust, and legitimacy of the NYPD and other city officials. Um, and when you do submit 311 reports of this, um, the reports are immediately closed. And um, essentially the, the local precinct says, oh, well, we've taken care of it when, when in fact it hasn't. So on top of the illegal parking, they're actually creating um, an additional illegal document, uh, false document. So, um, you know, we, we definitely need to look at other mechanisms to prevent this from happening. And it really needs to start from the top. You know, it really needs to start from leadership, um, holding themselves accountable. And it's it's shown that it's been shown that NYPD is just either incapable or unwilling to, to do this. And I think it's a great idea to move this enforcement action to a different agency. So um, I really hope that everyone can support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, our next panelist will be Bill Feinberg. Bill? Hi. Yes, uh, I'm Bill Feinberg. I live in the Gramercy area. And I was uh, actually taken aback by uh, Ms. Uh, Forleone's uh, testimony that uh, placards don't really have anything to do with this hearing and uh, we're concentrating on bike uh, bike lanes which I appreciate the bike lane issue but um, what I'm looking at is um, and I and I've proposed I made a proposal to Polly Trachtenberg and city council members and I really appreciate what Stephen uh, Levin has done um, everything is connected um, and I had proposed um, charging $500 a year for the 166,000 pl placards in New York City. It would generate probably $100 million just in Manhattan. Eliminate all, pl all placard parking at Muni meters. Here in Gramercy, between 22nd and 3rd, and 15th and Irving, there are 50 metered spots. Every day, an average of 38 spots are taken up by placard parking. That's about $1.2 million a year lost just on those 38 parking spaces for 300 days a year. We've also proposed resident parking, $250 a year. Only residents of the neighborhood, let's say in my neighborhood, 14th to 34th, River to 5th, uh, that would generate about uh, three, <coughs> excuse me, $3 million a year. 
it would also eliminate people driving in from the uh, outside the city and searching for spots, double parking, idling. Um, all told, the city could raise about two hundred and fifty million. Cops park everywhere in my neighborhood. They park on meters. They park on sidewalks. They block streets. In fact, the DOT has uh, at the 13th precinct, they haven't done a thing about blocking 21st Street between 2nd and 3rd, which the cops took up uh, after um, George Floyd. They haven't done a thing. The New York NYPD can't block streets. Only the DOT can. But in my proposal, we would raise $250 million, eliminate congestion, and uh, stop corruption. Also, uh, it was also pointed out that uh, the uh, police destroy their plates. They alter plates. They bend plates. And that's only meant to, uh, to stop paying tolls. I have to pay tolls. I have no, I have no problem. I understand uh, it brings in revenue and pays for streets. But they destroy, uh, they destroy their plates to get around uh, paying uh, their uh, rightful number. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, uh, I, I also wanted to thank Michael Dunn. Uh, he's absolutely right about license plate covers and bent plates, and Michael Streeter about idling. Um, and also, I, it is absolutely ridiculous, as Glenn uh, Belowski pointed out, that uh, um, UPS and all these other companies bulk pay tickets at a, between $5 and $10, whereas if I... And five, five minutes over a meter, I have to pay $65. Absolutely ridiculous and insulting. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, our next panelist will be Jeff Novich. Jeff? Starting time. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Novich, and I strongly support uh, Bill 2159. I am the creator of an app called Reported. It's a free app for New Yorkers to quickly submit complaints about cars illegally blocking bike lanes and crosswalks. Um, and in 2019, over 900 New Yorkers, many of them on this call, uh, filed over 18,000 submissions, all of them with photos that would qualify under this bill. Now, these complaints are then relayed to 311, and that's how reported works. We, it's a passion project. It makes no money, um, and there's no business. You can guess what happened to each of these. I ran the numbers, looked at the SR numbers, and virtually none of these complaints sent to the NYPD yielded a summons, literally like 10 out of 18,000. In addition, NYPD responded on average three hours after a submission was made, making it nearly impossible to, uh, to uh, catch these drivers. Now, 311 basically requires citizens to beg the New York uh, Police Department to respond to egregious violations like cars routinely blocking bike lanes and just pray that they do their job. We've all been in there. And I'm here today to say that that current system, the current system does not work. And we, this is why we need this bill. On a more personal note, I live in Harlem. Um, and before COVID, I regularly commuted to Chelsea by a city bike. My wife bikes our two children, soon to be three on a Dutch cargo bike. We have routinely had to deal with drivers blocking bike lanes, something made more dangerous when you have children with you. The NYPD has been virtually ineffective. They frequently block the bike lanes themselves as Streets Blog has uh, covered recently. So I recognize this bill won't solve all of the problems, but it gives citizens a way to hold drivers accountable without having to engage NYPD. So it's a major step forward uh, towards directly addressing the scourge of cars and bike lanes. Um, if I have two, two seconds, I just wanted to add three additional pieces of feedback to strengthen the bill. One, I think it should include no standing zones. I don't know why that's excluded. It's illegal, even if you have a valid placard. Number two, the designation of 1,320 feet from a school entrance is arbitrary and irrelevant. That's been said. No one's carrying a tape measure here. An SUV blocking a crosswalk that's 1,400 feet from a school is still uh, blocking. Uh, your crosswalk. And number three, I think the requirements need to be simple. Uh, New Yorkers need to be able to submit these in under 30 seconds. That's how we built reported. Makes it really easy if you make those uh, uh, requirements really tedious. 
um, you're not going to have citizens engaging in this in this bill. Thank you for your time on this important subject. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Um, does anyone have a question for this panelist? Okay. Um, Seeing none, our next panelist will be Ryan Frank. Ryan? Starting time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Frank. I'm a resident of the Upper West Side and I work in Sunset Park. I'm testifying today in support of Councilmember Levin's legislation. Uh, I started to raise, raise concern about cyclist safety after a friend of mine, Deborah Freelander, was killed in 2019 while riding her bike on Bushwick Avenue. She was one of 29 cyclist fatalities in New York City that year. And uh, after Deborah's death, I became more conscious of the scourge of illegal parking and how it creates unsafe road conditions for cyclists as well as pedestrians and drivers. Uh, one spot that has been consistently problematic is the bike lane on Columbus Avenue near the 20th precinct, not far from where I live. Uh, cars with placards are consistently parked there illegally, partially obstructing a bike lane and a no standing zone. Uh, I've reached out to the 20th precinct. I've attended community council meetings. I've spoken with Helen Rosenthal's office, uh, made numerous 311 complaints, all to no avail. And the problem persists. And in my experience, the police department has been unhelpful and unwilling to address the issue. Uh, I've witnessed and heard about countless other placard abuse hotspots throughout the city. We've heard from some of these from uh, the panelists and speakers today. Uh, there's a, a, a car with an FDNY placard that parks on my block on a near daily basis, blocking a crosswalk and a hydrant. I've uh, made 311 complaints and uh, nothing gets done. Um, with all due respect to NYPD Chief Royster, who spoke earlier, you know, I don't think we need more communication or messaging. We need consequences for illegal behavior. Uh, we see illegal parking happening throughout the city every single day. Uh, and as many people pointed out, all you need is not just a, a NYPD placard, but uh, you know, sometimes it's just a thin blue line sticker on the bumper and uh, they seem to be exempt from parking laws. Uh, you know, the Department of Transportation with the city council, with community Bye. boards, they collectively determine how our space is allocated. It should not be up to a few people who happen to have a parking placard to supersede those rules. They need to be leading by example. We need more transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none, I would now like to ask if there are any other panelists that we might have missed on our list, if you could please use the raised hand function. Okay, um, seeing none, I'll turn it back over to Chair Rodriguez. Helio, I think that there's someone raising a hand in the screen, so if you can look at it. Uh, okay, um, it looks like we have one more, uh, Jana, um, if, if we could give her two minutes. Starting time. Can we please uh, unmute Jenna Leo? Okay, so I'm completely in support of this law. I will say remove the limitation from the school and apply everywhere and not only to certain areas. The fines should be increased at least to 250. My experience is that all the reports are always closed. And I will say this a fine is necessary. You know, we are in violence with traffic in the same state that we were with uh, sexual violence in the 70s. You know, to prevent day rape, you don't tell a guy to behave. You charge for breaking the law. Okay, this is what we have to do. We have to charge for breaking the law and the charge is going to be a fine. You know, a byline block doesn't mean only visibility block, but body exposed to the cars on the other line. It's almost impossible to have an accident in a bike. At least you have a heart attack, you know? You know, biking on itself is very safe. Is the traffic and the culture of cars 
is worth is not. Most likely, if you have an accident in your bike, you are going to be hit by a car or by a truck. In my route daily from Harlem to Chinatown, the number of trucks has increased. I see with the green uh, greenway in Hudson Close, in Riverside Park, I see five delivery trucks every day. I have to avoid the bus every day. Then when I take my route east in Carmine Street, there are five to seven cars there every day. You know, often, if I have the time, I go down to my bike and I actually make the point of talking to them. Five, hopefully, they move. Sometimes they do. Most likely, they laugh at me. You know, uh, we really need to put fines. We need to enforce things because that's the way we do everything here. You do something that is illegal, you get a fine or you go to jail, video. I really, really want to add something else. And this is a plea, this is a plea to the to the de Blasio administration. Please stop the blah, 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 de Blasio, blah, blah, blah. Stop the blah, blah, blah rhetoric. A rhetoric talk is used in this de Blasio administration. We are thank having you. this meeting today. Sorry, thank you. The time is fine, so thank you very much, Miss. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, now, let's, before I close, I would like to uh, call on Council Member Levin if he has anything to say before I do my closing remark. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I just, I greatly appreciate all the testimony um, uh, from the public just now. Um, and it certainly um, is heartening to know that um, uh, the public sees the need for legislation um, uh, so strongly, and um, and certainly that that there's um, calling out that there's not really a valid countervailing argument. Um, the argument that was made by the administration was. Um, Really devoid of, um, of, of any real substance, and um, um, you know, I'm I'm happy to talk with anybody about kind of the parameters of the bill. There are certain reasons why the um, the radius is in place, um, uh, and um, uh, and and some of the um, you know. For example, why why regular no standing is not is not in this bill. Um, the goal uh, from our end is to at least from my end is to ensure that that the most dangerous um, uh, parking uh, infractions that are going un um, unpunished right now, or um, uh, that those are covered, um, and so. Um, Focusing on on the ones that that really force not just the illegal parking because there are all, you know there's a lot of illegal parking that's not covered in this bill but the ones that are forcing cyclists or pedestrians um, into into oncoming traffic and, and into harm's way um, that's the goal of this legislation and because keep in mind all of these things are illegal to begin with um, and. Um, and so what we're doing here, we're not allowed legally to create alternate means of enforcement for existing laws. That's why we're creating a new, a new infraction. Um, and so there's kind of legal, so it gets into the legality of it, but um, I'm happy to talk about that further with anyone that wishes to hear from that. And with that, I'll turn, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I would like to thank everyone, the advocates, the administration for being part of this hearing. And I will continue having conversation with the speaker, Councilmember Levin, on the bill that, uh, that we are discussing today. As a chairman of this committee, I can tell you that those of you who were the leaders and the champion in the 80s and the 90s, when we didn't have bike lane in many places, in Dykeman, in, in Amsterdam Avenue, many, all the area throughout the five or we can compare how far things that we were not doing in the 80s and the 90s and where we are today. So I'm pretty sure that all of us agree last year was a bad one for all of us when it came to the numbers of cyclists and pedestrians that lost their life. However, 
when we compare numbers before and after Vision Zero, what we have done in the last eight years, no doubt that we have taken the city to a better place when it comes to the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. Is that enough? The answer is no. And we as New Yorkers has to be ambitious. We can accomplish our goal established by Mayor de Blasio, by all of us at the council, to be sure that we bring to zero the numbers of pedestrians and cyclists being killed, losing their life in the city of New York. So I think that you know, there's a lot that had to be done. I'm proud of all those bills in, in, in every different way of how we have addressed Vision Zero, especially from us at the council, the administration, DOT commissioner. And we are here today holding this hearing because we know that much more can be done. So let's continue working together. Let's be sure that we save the life of every single New Yorker. Let's be sure that we take the necessary measure to address illegal parking. Let's be sure that as we have from the NYPD, an assessment is done on how many cars need parking space spots around the prison. I feel that we are in a good place because thanks to Vision Zero, initiative, thanks to a transportation alternative, a, a family for safe streets, academic, individual, the public and private sector, we all understand and agree that we can reduce the numbers of individuals losing their life. COVID-19 is a pandemic that has hit our city big time. However, the numbers of individuals losing their life as a result of crashes is another pandemic that we can control and we can eradicate it. We need to look at urban planning. We need to look on using the technology. We will need to look at enforcement. I feel if we combine all those area, all those tools, we definitely can make the city of New York a role model in the whole nation when it came to build ourselves as a cyclist and, and pedestrian friendly. This is issue related to safety in our streets, but I also want to be close this hearing in a topic that, topic that is not related to safety in our streets. We need to get rid of, of that guy that took our nation to allow terrorist attack to happen in DC. We need to throw all our support to 11 members of the New York City congressional delegation, to majority very soon to be a Senator Schumer, to Pelosi and everyone. It is a sad to hear that guy that unfortunately was from Brooklyn in the White House, going to the border of Texas, saying that he doesn't regret what he did. He needs to pay for his consequences. Using fake news, and so his son, former Mayor Giuliani, to deny the victory of a Biden and Harris took our nation to be in danger. And as yesterday, what had been disclosed, they had a plan to attack all state capital building. So let's continue addressing improving safety for pedestrians and cyclists. But as we speaking today, the danger that we face today is by that guy that we have in, in DC. Any minutes that we have in, in DC put our nation and the world in danger and we need to take him out of the White House. With that, this hearing is adjourned.